Okay, sorry. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to welcome all members to the first full committee markup for the fiscal year 2022, including the six new Democratic members of the committee. Representative Adriano Espaillat from New York, Representative Josh Harder from California, Representative Jennifer Wexton of Virginia, Representative David Trone from Maryland, Representative Lauren Underwood from Illinois, and Representative Susie Lee from Nevada. I also would like to welcome our newly Republican members uh, appointed to the committee, but I know that my colleague, the ranking member, uh, Granger, will introduce the new members on her side shortly. Again, I really once again welcome all of you to this distinguished committee. Um, I believe, and I've said before to all, that this committee uh, is central. The Appropriations Committee is central to the function, functioning of our government. And in that regard, I am going to deal with two quotes, one from Richard Fenno in his book, The Power of the Purse, the one and recurring procedure for congressional control over government is the annual appropriations review and the provision of funds. And secondly, quote the U.S. Constitution, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Before we begin, I have a number of housekeeping announcements. First, in accordance with the Office of the Attending Physician and their guidance, non-vaccinated individuals must wear masks and maintain six feet separation from others. The room is set up for social distancing. Also, this information was previously conveyed to your staff, but let me reiterate that no food is allowed in this room. Otherwise, our Ways and Means friends uh, may turn us out. <laughs> but drinks are fine if you have a lid. I have arranged to have lunch provided, and it will be in the Minority Conference Room in Longworth 1036. That's directly below this hearing room. And I want to say a special thank you to Ranking Member Granger for providing the space. Many thanks. For those of you joining remotely, please be um, just, we want to make sure that uh, you see us, we see you, and that uh, we can uh, uh, communicate uh, without any, any difficulties. And with that, what I'd like to do is to offer a few welcoming remarks to everyone. Um, this is a maiden voyage uh, for me, and I'm just delighted to be uh, with all of you. But as we begin the first full Appropriations Committee markup for fiscal year 2022, uh, I am struck by the gravity of responsibility that we have not only to our constituents in this process, but also to the many historic leaders both Democratic and Republican chairs who have shaped the United States of America for over 150 years. In many ways, our work here today honors their legacies and what legacies they are. The very first chairman of this committee was Thaddeus Stevens, who fought to secure the freedom promised by the 13th Amendment, investigated the violence against African Americans and other Union loyalists in the South following the end of the Civil War. And in my own tenure on the committee, we have seen the work of William Natcher, a fierce advocate for infrastructure funding, and David Obey, an ardent champion of education and healthcare funding. In recent years, we have been ably led by Hal Rogers, who we are honored to still have with us on the dais today, Rodley Freelingheiser, and my dear friend, Nita Lowy. In their own ways, they each affected the trajectory of our nation. I'm in awe of how much we can impact people's lives and the obligations that creates. We touch every aspect of American people's lives. At its best, we can provide greater opportunity and essential support for all of our citizens who just want a chance to work hard and to reach the American dream. This is especially important now as we are still recovering 
from the greatest public health and economic crisis in a generation. I have in my office a quote to which I turn often, and that's from Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who said, and I quote, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. That is my mission as I lead through this committee, together through the more than $1.5 trillion that goes through our 12 subcommittees. We will invest in the American people. We will create good paying jobs, grow opportunity in every corner of the nation, and provide a lifeline to the middle class, to small businesses, to the vulnerable. We will confront rising inequality by mobilizing the whole of government to build a society and an economy that works for every American. And so I am proud of the way we have already begun this work with a strong and an inclusive approach. Our chairs, informed by the expertise of the diverse voices of this committee, have crafted strong bills. There are, of course, disagreements in some areas, and in the coming weeks, we will debate these bills, oftentimes vigorously. But it is in a collaborative approach that the Appropriations Committee distinguishes itself. So as we mark up these bills this week, I hope we do so with the same goal we had for the same country that we all love, building back a better nation where everyone has the opportunity to contribute and to succeed. And now, with that, I would like to turn uh, and yield to my friend, the ranking member of the committee, Congressman Granger, for any introductory remarks that she may have. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to congratulate you on your first markup as full committee chair. Uh, you've represented your district in the Congress well, and you deserve the role you serve in. I look forward to working with you on the many decisions that we are charged within this committee. The pandemic has affected each of us in a profound way, including how Congress and this committee operates. As the pandemic nears an end, I'm very happy to be in person and to be here in person and to be able to work alongside our members face to face. Uh, I hope we can fully transition back to normal, reopening the Capitol and returning to business as usual. I also want to welcome all our new committee members. If they haven't learned already, this is the best committee in the Congress, and I'm honored to work with you. They are Congressman David Valdeo of California, who's a returning member, Congressman Guy Reschenthaler, <laughs> I practiced on that too, Reschenthaler of Pennsylvania, sorry, Congressman Mike Garcia of California, Congressman Ben Klein of Virginia, my fellow Texan, Congressman Tony Gonzalez, and Congresswoman Ashley Henson of, of Iowa. I also want to recognize and thank Congressman Tom Cole for his continued service as our vice ranking member. Thank you. I've called on you many times recently. Thank you very much. Members for their hard work this Congress. Madam Chair, I look forward to a successful markup season as we're all eager to get back to work. And in closing, I would like to thank committee staff for their hard work on these bills. We have a great team on both sides, and I thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Granger. It is a pleasure to work with you and, uh, and, and look forward to continuing that relationship as well. Let me now ask um, uh, if, if I would like to invite any member, any other member who wishes to make opening remarks at this time to do so. Congresswoman Kaptur is recognized. Yes, Madam Chair, I rise in support of the 302B allocations. No. Uh, we're not there yet, Mark. Oh, we're not there yet? Right. Okay, sorry. Build back. Okay. 
Is there anyone who would like to uh, make an opening remarks? Okay. Seeing none, let me um, uh, proceed with the business portion of the meeting. Uh, and again, I have to begin with a brief explanation of how the markup will work for those who are joining us uh, virtually. Once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the main screen. And speaking into the microphone activates the camera, displaying the speaker on the main screen. Do not stop your remarks if you do not immediately see the screen switch. If the screen does not change after several seconds, please make sure you are not muted. And to minimize background noise and to ensure the correct speaker is being displayed, we ask that you remain on mute unless you have sought recognition. The chair or an individual designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. If during one of the meetings we need to move things along and we decide to enforce the five-minute rule, you will notice a clock at the bottom of your screen that will show how much time is remaining. When your time is up, the clock will turn red, and I may gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has expired before recognizing another member. And finally, we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our markups, including documents to be inserted in the record by unanimous consent, amendments, motions, other unanimous consent requests, and so on. That email address has been provided to your staff. I would remind all members that they must verbally request unanimous consent separately from sending the document or written UC request to the email address. And our first order of business is uh, to consider the sub-allocation of budget allocations for fiscal year 2022, also known as the 302Bs. Despite that very technical name, this document is the nuts and bolts of the appropriations process, determining how the funding that we will appropriate this year is allocated among the 12 annual appropriations bills. The overall top line funding allocated this year is consistent with President Biden's budget request and with the deeming resolution adopted by the House this month. It will allow for important investments across a wide range of areas, and I would like to highlight just a few. After decades of disinvestment and the devastation of the coronavirus pandemic, the American economy caters to the wealthy, leaves the middle class, working families, small businesses, and the vulnerable behind. We can reverse that with our funding bills this year. We will invest in the American people and creating those good jobs and, and opportunity. We will confront the many challenges that our country faces today, most of which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. These allocations will allow us to build support for families and children through expanded access to programs like Head Start and Child Care, create good paying American jobs through investments in a green economy and economic development in underserved communities, repair our health and education infrastructure, investing in good schools, access to higher education, better health care, and life-saving medical research, rebuild our crumbling physical infrastructure, including with investments in roads, bridges, transit, and public housing, tackle hun hunger and nutrition, and security with funding for vital nutrition programs that feed American kids and families. Lift up rural communities with initiatives like rural broadband that will create jobs and deliver hope. Protect our democracy from the capital grounds to countering the Chinese threat around the world. And as we make these specific investments, these allocations will also allow this Congress to close persistent racial disparities, foster equality for women and men, and confront the climate crisis with actions across the whole of government. The investments we are making are historic, they are transformational, and they are what the American people need at this moment. I urge your support for these allocations. And now I'd like to recognize the ranking member uh, for any remarks that she may have on the allocations. Madam Chair, thank you for yielding. These spending allocations will increase discretionary spending by hundreds of billions of dollars to an all-time high of $1.5 trillion. 
This nearly 9% increase above fiscal year 2021 comes at a time of record high deficits and debt. This month, the national debt reached an astonishing $28.3 trillion. In the first eight months of this fiscal year, we have already borrowed $2.1 trillion. We must exercise fiscal responsibility and return to reasonable levels of federal spending now that the pandemic hopefully is nearing an end. Although these allocations do not show the exact split between defense and non-defense programs, we know the top line is based on the President's budget. Those numbers include an enormous 17 percent increase to non-defense programs at the same time the President's budget cut defense spending to below inflation. We're facing increasing national security and technological threats from adversaries like Iran, Russia, and China. Underfunding our national defense right now is completely unacceptable to members on my side of the aisle. This year marks the first time in over a decade that the Appropriations Committee will consider bills without any budget caps in law. Unfortunately, instead of coming together with Republicans to figure out common sense funding levels, the Biden administration doubled down on increasing domestic spending while refusing to provide our military with even baseline levels of support. We also need to be mindful that many of the non-defense programs in this year's appropriations bills have already received huge amounts of funding this year in the $1.9 trillion mandatory spending bill that the majority pushed through Congress without bipartisan support. On top of that, the Biden administration wants $4 trillion more in mandatory spending this year and trillions of tax increases over the next decade. I'm afraid these appropriation bills will only serve as messaging documents and leave us in a continuing resolution in October. With less than 100 days left before the end of the fiscal year, we need to get the, to work now to craft bills that can be enacted. I urge the majority to work with us to ensure responsible funding levels, especially for our national defense, and to remove controversial policy riders that will prevent laws from being signed into law. In closing, I'm disappointed in our failure to come together to find bipartisan consensus on spending levels and allocations. I hope we can find common ground during markups over the next few weeks and in the months ahead. I urge a no vote and I yield back my time. Does any other member wish to speak on the allocations? Congresswoman Kaptur. Yes, Madam Chair, I now rise in uh, support of the 302 V allocations. Uh, Chairwoman DeLauro has really put forward a well-crafted a proposal to set spending levels for the upcoming year, what an outstanding job she has done. Our nation is facing challenges of confidence in effective governance, and the subcommittee allocations provide resources to ensure that American institutions that protect the American way of life stay vibrant. This proposal helps our nation remain steadfast and prepares our institutions to confront a variety of difficult challenges that lie ahead. These suballocations address pressing needs of our nation on national security, opioids, infrastructure, child care and education for our youth, access to health care including mental health resources, our veterans, and the impact on our national resources with a changing climate, among other priorities. On my home subcommittee of Energy and Water, Defense and Interior, the allocations have provided the tools to address an innumerable array of challenges, and I am proud to be a member of this committee because we truly hold and use the power of the purse as stewards for the American people. I urge a yes vote and yield back. Thank you, Congressman Kaptur. Does any other member wish to speak? And Congressman Walmack is recognized. I thank the uh, chairwoman. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise in opposition. Uh, I join my ranking member in uh, opposing the proposed allocations. And before I talk about those, let me just recognize where we are. It's the 29th day of June. We're a little more than 90 days away from the beginning of a fiscal year. And this is the first markup in the first chamber that has the responsibility to fund the discretionary budget 
of the United States government, the government that represents the best nation this world has ever seen, and yet here we are about 90 days away from the beginning of a fiscal year, and anybody in this room that <coughs> thinks that we're going to have our work finished in sufficient time to give all of our organizations the necessary planning to execute their program of work over the next year would be naive to think so. But let's get back to the allocations for a minute. And my bill that we'll mark up here in a few minutes is probably a good case study because it increases the overall number by 16 percent and double-digit increases for various agencies, in fact, most all the agencies that, uh, that the FSGG bill covers. At the expense of something important to all of us, so important it's in our Constitution to provide for the common defense. And I'm not going to talk about all the, uh, the, the, the cuts to the Army, the, the big Army, the big Navy, Air Force, and so on. I, I want to speak to all of you as members of Congress who have people that you represent that are in the National Guard and the Reserves. They are already a half billion dollars short because of what we ask them to do following January 6th in guarding this, these premises. And if we don't fix that, you can expect that every single one of us are going to be getting phone calls in August and September when NGB starts talking about having to withhold funds that normally would go to mutual training assemblies. We just simply can't let that happen. Dangerous cuts to national security. So I think we can do better. I think we should do better. I think the American people are asking us to do better. So I would hope, though I'm not entirely optimistic this will be the case, that we will go back and rethink these allocations, take better care of our men and women in uniform, and make sure that our country is on the, the proper path. And that path is not just continue to throw enormous obscene amounts of money at the various agencies that we fund in various tranches. And instead, let's get back to doing the business the American people ask us to do. I think we can do better. We should do better. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Does any other member wish to speak on the allocation? Congressman Ryan. Appreciate the opportunity. Just want to address a couple of the concerns uh, the gentleman from Arkansas raised, but I first want to thank him for the Huckleberry Preserves. Your speech was not as sweet as the preserves were, but <laughs> we'll let that slide for now. Um, I think just a couple points. <clears throat> and, and the gentleman from Arkansas and I, we sit on the Defense Appropriations Committee. There are concerns I think that we share, and that's important to uh, continue to have that conversation. Um, it is important for us to recognize that this administration did not get any cooperation from the past administration, which completely slowed up the ability to present a budget to this Congress. And it was drug out because of the lack of a seamless transition, and it got pushed into May. Within a month, we started doing our business here, which I think is a credit to this committee, to our staff, and, and to the leadership here. With regard to the National Guard, we were very concerned about that. We included in the security supplemental $524 million for us to make sure that the National Guard was made whole for their commitment here. And many, if not all, on the other side voted against that. And lastly, let me just say, we are in a moment of tremendous income inequality. We are in a tremendous competition against China, which we need to deal with militarily, but we also need to deal with domestically. And that means we have got to outcompete them. And if we are going to outcompete China with 330 million people in this country and 1.3 or 4 billion in their country, the only way to do that is to make investments into our people, into our health, our education, and our skills into our businesses, into our broadband, into our public infrastructure. 
That's how you outcompete China. So I know, for one, and I think no one on our side is going to apologize for after years of gutting programs, we're going to reinvest back into the American people so we can compete defense, but also compete domestically to make the kind of country that can outcompete China in the global economy that we need to have. And that's the reason for these investments. And you will see no or hear no apologies on our side. I yield back the balance of my time. Does anyone wish to speak? Madam Chair. <coughs> Mr. Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank her for her remarks and for her comments, uh, and the ranking member for her comments as well. An honor to be a new member of this committee, and, and uh, it is truly the best committee, as the ranking member said. And it's an honor to be one of the appointees uh, from that Appropriations Committee to the Budget Committee. Uh, I, too, am concerned about the level of spending, uh, but also I'm concerned about the process by which we're operating. Normally, the House and Senate Budget Committees are to report budget resolutions that set appropriations levels and lay out our fiscal principles. And sadly, we haven't done that. The President's budget was released well after it should have been in order for us to appropriately evaluate the nation's spending needs, especially in light of already appropriated and unspent funds to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, the proposed allocations will increase discretionary spending to over $1.5 trillion, setting a new record. This is an almost 9% increase above fiscal year 2021 enacted. In fact, the President's budget proposed a nearly 17% increase to non-defense programs, while not even funding defense at CBO's inflation-adjusted baseline level. This is unacceptable given the many threats we face right now and investments in other countries like China are making in technology. With the end of the Budget Control Act, we are in a cap-free environment for the first time in many years. And while the majority had an opportunity to reach consensus with us on reasonable allocations, that has not happened. Instead, they decided to ramp up spending with nearly all gains going to non-defense programs. And many of these domestic spending programs behave like quasi-entitlements. Once funding is drastically increased, it becomes very difficult to pare them down. And this is just too much spending at a time of unprecedented deficits and debt. $28.3 trillion in debt for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations to pay back. And on top of the trillions in mandatory spending enacted earlier this year, the administration wants Congress to pass another $4 trillion in additional mandatory spending. The fact that we're even talking about trillions passing multiple times in a single year is extremely troubling. The fiscal year is ending soon, and if the majority doesn't want to end up in a full year continuing resolution, we should work together to amend the bills with more reasonable post-pandemic funding levels, sufficient defense funding within the top line, and no controversial policy riders. Without going through the appropriations process, we're leading the nation to a fiscal cliff that has me concerned about our future. I hope that we can correct this because it's in all of our interests to pass good bills that can become law. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Congresswoman McCollum. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and to my fellow committee members. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the Defense Subcommittee for the Appropriations. I want you to know a couple of facts. One fact is that President Biden's budget only came in about four, three to four days later than President Trump's budget did the first term he was in office. The other fact is that we know it was not a smooth transition. We had COVID, and we had the attack on this Capitol on January 6th. So that's a fact we should all keep in mind as we're criticizing the Biden administration for not doing things in a timely fashion. The second fact is, is that the increase that will go to the defense appropriation is more than the increase that the Trump administration provided the Department of Defense in its last budget. Those are facts, folks. The other thing that I would like to uh, reflect on, and I'm not going to get into the defense bill because we have not had our subcommittee markup yet, and it would not be proper to do so, but to the allocations. Mr. Ryan is right on target, totally on target, 
We need to invest in our workforce, all the Department of Defense and all the people who work in the defense industry have told me we need to beef up our workforce. And these allocations will do that. The issue that we faced with health care, with COVID, and the effects that it had on our economy, and the effects that it had potentially on our national security, we need to invest in health care. And folks, we have military members who are on food stamps. And I'm working to change that along I'm with both sides of the aisle on this issue. But folks, we need to invest in agriculture and food stamps so they are not only available for our citizens who are seniors and our children who should not go to school hungry, but also for our military men and women to know that their families are cared for. So as we talk about broadband and other investments. I hear from our business community that works with our Department of Defense on this all the time. So folks, national security is about the defense of our nation, but it's also about making sure our nation is a bright, shining light for all of its citizens to succeed. And so with that, Madam Chair, I wholly support these allocations. And so, uh, I am proud to mark the defense bill up to what President Biden, Secretary Austin, as well as the Joint Chiefs of Staffs, General Milley says we can do in order to secure our nation. It is so unfortunate that this bill has now, with the allocations, become a discussion on the Defense Committee, who has not even had the opportunity to have its first subcommittee markup. With that, I yield back. Thank you, General Lady, and if I might add, and in personal conversations with General Austin. Uh, he intimated that, in fact, they could very well deal with a 1.7 percent increase uh, in the defense spending. I asked him specifically about that, knowing of people's concerns. And I think when we can listen to uh, General uh, Austin and General Milley, and t who are intimately involved with what is happening in, in defense, uh, that we ought to take their that we ought to take their lead, and with that, I'd like to uh, uh, yield to uh, Congressman Calvert. Uh, yes, uh, sure, uh, no. the, you have to press the. It says talk. Okay. Yeah, there you go. I, I uh, wasn't going to speak to the uh, to the uh, numbers uh, today, but I, I I must do so. The the increase on the defense budget that was referred to, the 1.7 percent, uh, doesn't even match the inflation rate. We're going to have probably, um, based upon today's numbers that I looked at in the Wall Street Journal, about a 3.5 percent inflation rate this year. So that's a significant cut in itself. Um, I just want to point out our peer competition. I'll just bring up China. China are out now, right now outnumbers us in the South Pacific five to one. Five times more ships, five times more missiles, five times more military personnel. Uh, their satellite capability is increasing daily. Uh, and uh, we're building eight ships this year. Chinese are building two ships a month, every month. And they're capable ships, not uncapable ships. So, uh, in my mind, uh, this, uh, this defense budget is not adequate, um, and uh, so I know we're going to have this discussion as we go along uh, with, the, with the chairman, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's going to be a problem and we're going to have to deal with it. Uh, with that, I'll yield back. Anyone else who wish to speak on the um, allocations? Madam Chair. Madam Chair? Yes. Congresswoman Hinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ranking Member Grager, um, and to my colleagues in the room as well um, for your work. I do have grave concerns about these 302B allocations presented before us today. Um, along with my colleague, uh, Congressman Klein, uh, we both serve as the designees to the Budget Committee for this um, committee, and it's our responsibility, obviously, to ensure for the American taxpayer that um, the budgeting process is working for them. Um, I came to Washington to help rein in out-of-control spending and advocate for the taxpayer, and I thought, I really did think that um, this process, this dual committee assignment, would allow us to do that properly. But instead, it has really opened my eyes to just how broken this process is here in Washington, D.C., and how much work there is to do um, in this very room. 
Um, the good news is that I still believe the members of this committee can, can work together to, to put, put, a, put a shining light on this and improve this situation. Um, I think we should be using the, the budget committee process and the entire congressional budget process properly. We need to allow that committee to do its work properly um, instead of establishing these budgetary levels to keep spending in check and just ramming through um, a massive partisan spending plan like we're seeing what's happening here that costs taxpayers trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, we shouldn't be deeming our top line numbers and then working backwards from there. It's backwards. Um, it's irresponsible and it's how we get to a place of mixed up priorities like what we're seeing today. Um, nearly every single one of these 302Bs shows a substantial increase to push an agenda that is not benefiting the average American. But there is one 302B that's astonishingly absent from this list of massive increases, and it's the defense level, which we've already heard about from several of my colleagues here today. At a time when we are facing daily threats um, from terrorist groups abroad and obviously our countries that we've discussed that are amounting uh, threats to us as well, counter adversaries like China and Russia, uh, we must ensure that our government is also performing um, its most basic functions to provide for the common defense for us. But unfortunately, this proposal before us today in the 302Bs fails woefully short on that front. The defense allocation is abysmal, and when you adjust for inflation, it is uh, actually a cut. Congress is even giving itself more money with a healthy plus up for the ledge branch, while uh, those that keep our country safe overseas and our agents at our southern border are left with breadcrumbs. The priorities laid before us today are not the priorities of working Americans, and the result of this irresponsible spending is clear. Gas prices are up, the cost of lumber has skyrocketed, and a tax on working families has come in the form of inflation that we're seeing across this country. And for what? To support Green New Deal policies and large government programs that are keeping workers home, all while Main Street businesses are suffering. We have before us today a plan that vastly expands the size of the federal government, adding more than 50,000 new federal employees. And I represent Northern Iowa, Northeast Iowa, including Howard and Worth counties, if you do the math and add up the population of those two counties and then multiply that by three, you still do not get the number of new federal employees that this budget and these spending priorities would add. The American people are smart, Madam Chair, and they don't like government bloat. I don't like it either, and I don't think many members of this committee like it. So I cannot support a plan that prioritizes bigger government for the sake of bigger government over the needs of everyday Iowans. And I urge my colleagues to reject these spending levels Let's begin keeping the American taxpayer in mind. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let the Budget Committee do its proper work and not bypass this process. Madam Chair, I yield back. I'd like to recognize uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Congressman Wasserman Schultz. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll be brief. I, I just find the um, hypocrisy a little rich when from 2011 until 2018, our friends in the minority never once passed a concurrent budget and did exactly as we are doing here today. So spare me the crocodile tears and the out feigned outrage of establishing what we view as responsible 302Bs when you actually did the exact same thing, but in an, a far less responsible way. So we're happy to come together with you and work on a budget, but it, it would probably require the, our friends on the other side of the aisle to develop priorities that actually reflect the values and the needs of the American people. But it's just important to note that there is nothing different being done today that hasn't been done every single fiscal year during the last stint that the minority served in the majority. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Does any other member wish to speak on the allocate? Any other member wish to speak on the allocate? Madam Chair? There is Yes, I just wish to place on the record for the sake of those listening and certainly for our members, if you add up the funding in the defense accounts, uh, $705 billion, and MILCON VA, $124, if you put those together, you actually come up with uh, over $800 billion just in the defense-related accounts, 
all the other, that's just two subcommittees, all the other subcommittees, uh, if uh, uh, 10 of them total 594 billion. So just important to really look at the math here. And uh, I think that uh, the defense of the country is well accommodated uh, by the numbers that have been provided by the budget, and I yield back. And again, it's reinforced by what the military has said to us, that, uh, uh, that they can do very, very well with the amount of money that has been allocated. And I like to take the advice from those who are in charge of the military and who are going to be conducting the operations to make sure our national security is, in fact, secure. Are there any other members who wish, wish to speak on the allocations? I may make one more point. Uh, it just goes back to earlier comments. If the schedules hold with um, what we have, uh, what we are doing with subcommittee, full committee, and getting to the floor, this will be the shortest turnaround from a budget release to passing bills on the floor of the House of Representatives uh, in record time with great work done uh, by, the, uh, by the subcommittees, and I might add on both sides of the aisle. Um, are there any amendments to this report? If there are no amendments and no further discussion, I recognize Ms. Kaptur for a motion to approve the 302B allocations. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I move that the committee approve the report on the 302B allocations for fiscal year 2022. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Th no. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, please raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos? Aye. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Calvert? No. Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter? No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Cartwright? Aye. Mr. Cartwright, Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case? Aye. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein? No. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. Aye. Mr. Christ votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro votes aye. Mr. diaz Bullard. No. Mr. diaz Bullard votes no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Mr. Fortenberry. No. Mr. Fortenberry votes no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia? No. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. V Gonzalez votes no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder? Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris? No. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler? No. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mrs. Hinson? No. Mrs. Hinson votes no. Mr. Joyce? Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Kaptur? Aye. Ms. Kaptur votes aye. Mr. Kilmer? Aye. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick? Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence? Aye. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California? Aye. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada? Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Ms. Meng? Aye. Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar? No. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo? No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Ms. Pingree? Aye. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan? Aye. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard? Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger? Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford? 
Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson. No. Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Trone. Aye. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood. Aye. Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tally. On this vote, the ayes are 33, the noes are 25, the report is approved. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the report just approved. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Okay. Our next order of business Madam today. Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, yes, let me recognize. Thank you. I ask for three days for the minority to file views, please. Thank you. So ordered. Our next order of business today is consideration of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2022. I will now recognize Mr. Ryan to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, pleased to present to the committee and the Congress the 2022 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. While the subcommittee may be small in size, it has a very important role. I very much appreciate the hard work and collegial attitude of all of the members of this subcommittee, particularly the contributions and cooperation of our ranking member, Ms. Herrera Butler. This is a good bill, and I'm proud that it makes a substantial investment to expand recruitment and retention of staff, prioritizes funding to expand diversity and inclusion campus-wide, and funds needed investments to support the day-to-day -day operations of the House. Included within this bill is a 21% increase for the me member's representational allowance, which covers staff, district office space, and day-to-day -day operations for lawmakers to best serve our constituents. This has been a priority as I recognize the important role of expanding pay and benefits to the workers here, our staff, as we strive to recruit and retain a skilled and diverse workforce in our offices and retain these staff instead of losing them to the private sector. Additionally, this bill makes important steps in exploring other areas where we can uh, expand benefits for staff to continue to compete with the private sector. And as you all know, we continue to lose staff to the private sector, and we need to increase our ability to compete. And so this year's report directs the chief administrative officer to conduct a benefit and retention study to look at possibilities such as tuition credits, the creation of 529 accounts similar to the TSP with matching employer contributions, a housewide leave policy, and childcare subsidies so that we can continue to meet the needs of existing and future staff, all while trying to live in one of the most expensive cities in the United States. In a year full of trauma and hurt, with the apex being the insurrection on January 6th, our human resource entities within the Capitol complex have adapted to the evolving and increasing mental health needs of our campus. The bill includes $2.3 million, a $635 million increase for the Office of Employee Assistance, and $1.7 million for the Office of Wellbeing to ensure that they have the resources to support the needs of our community and the fund culturally sensitive mental health services so everyone feels comfortable 
seeking the support that they need. We also have included a $2 million allocation for the House Modernization Initiatives account to build off last year's efforts to make Congress more effective, efficient, and transparent on behalf of the American people. Second, the bill provides $15.4 million to expand the paid internship program. This will increase the amount to $35,000 per member office to pay interns. We also have extended this funding to committees and continue to support these funds being used for interns both in D.C. and in the district offices. This program is grounded in the recognition that millions of students and their families cannot afford to pay to support the life-changing opportunities of being a congressional intern. And we know so many people who would love to take advantage of the opportunity, would love to come to D.C., would love to change the trajectory of their life, and they just can't afford it. I believe that we have an obligation to make this opportunity here on the Capitol accessible to every student that would like to take advantage of that opportunity. We also recognize the ongoing inequities in congressional internships, and so we included language directing the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, working in conjunction with the Chief Administrative Officer to conduct a feasibility study on recreating a centralized house internship program, similar to the old LBJ program from years ago, which could provide various support services such as housing, training, professional development, and a focused outreach on students attending HBCUs, tribal colleges or universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, and other minority-serving institutions. I believe this is a vital step to creating a pipeline for students from all backgrounds to come and work on Capitol Hill. The bill also includes $3 million for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and directs the CAO to increase their staff cap from seven to 10 staffers to allow them to hire additional staff. It is vital that we prioritize initiatives to expand the diverse and talented workforce on Capitol Hill. The report provides an additional 350,000 to establish a task force within several uh, of the offices here uh, and any offices that may be necessary to develop a methodology for regularly surveying the House workforce on pay and benefit issues to provide guidance and support for the content and development of a centralized human resources hub and to make policy recommendations for how to improve human resources management practices throughout the House. Additionally, once again, this year's bill includes language to permit DACA recipients to work for Congress and other legislative branch agencies. I hope we can address this issue government-wide at some point, but in the meantime, I want to welcome these members of our national community to seek employment with Congress and the legislative branch agencies. Turning to the other ledge branch agencies, the bill provides strong support for the security and operational needs of the House and surrounding Capitol complex. I've included $603 million for the Capitol Police, which is an $89 million increase above the fiscal year 2021 bill. This provides with vital resources for training, recruitment, retention, and readiness efforts. This funding will provide for a total of 2,112 sworn officers. Additionally, this continues to build off previous efforts in ensuring a robust trauma and resiliency program for our sworn and civilian officers. This is an extremely important investment as they continue to heal from the events of January 6th and Good Friday. We also have an obligation to make sure we are retaining uh, the men and women who protect us here on the Capitol every single day. And that means their pay, their benefits, their retirement has to be competitive with other uh, law enforcement agencies in the region. Uh, and we try to address that in this bill and also in the security measure we passed many weeks ago. This bill includes an increase of $37 million from 2021 for the Library of Congress, as it is this subcommittee's duty to protect the valuable collections and preserve the library's ability to chronicle this great nation and provide access to our history for generations to come. And it includes $3.8 million to continue the library's work on the Veterans History Project to collect and preserve the personal accounts of American war veterans. $9.3 million for the Wounded Warrior Program and Gold Star Families Program. This bill also increases funding for the architect of the Capitol uh, by $152 million to address necessary construction activities such as the Cannon Office Building renovation. 
Also included are various other uh, provisions to ensure Capitol Visitor Center and the Capitol Complex is accessible for individuals with disabilities and all visitors who wish to tour the Capitol or meet with their members of Congress. Finally, the bill includes language for the removal of statues or busts in the Capitol of those who tried to overthrow the government of the United States or were white supremacists. And we carry language that prohibits the cost of living adjustment for members of Congress. Before I yield back, I would like to recognize the staff for all of the hard work and time they've put into this bill from the majority uh, committee staff. I'd like to uh, thank Steve Marques uh, for his fine work, who is doing his first cycle as the clerk of the Ledge Branch Committee. Anna Hansen, who uh, left us to go to uh, OPM. Uh, Malachi White and Rachel Jenkins from my staff, my legislative director. From the Minority Committee staff, I'd like to thank Michelle Ryan Shuttle uh, and her team for all their great work. Once again, I ask for your support for this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. I would now like to recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Ms. Herrera-Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, uh, and thank you, Ranking Member Granger, for your support for the legislative branch. It has been a privilege to work on this, on this subcommittee with Chairman Ryan. The recommendation for fiscal 2022 Ledge Branch probes, uh, provides $4.802 billion, excluding any funding for the Senate programs. This legislation addresses several challenges we've faced over the last year, and it equips Congress and our agencies with the resources necessary to safely return to work and reopen our Capitol campus. The House of Representatives increase will have a significant impact on our ability to serve our constituents uh, better by supporting new technology to increase the accessibility of casework forms. And for those who have ever worked as a staffer or who worked in the district office, this is actually very critical. Um, this increases staff retention. It's going to enhance the efficiency and transparency of house operations and will provide the ability to upgrade and acquire new technologies to strengthen the protection and productivity of our IT infrastructure. This bill also supports the critical mission of the Capitol Police by providing funding for additional personnel, which is badly needed, new leadership training initiatives, add retention benefits, equipment, and information gathering resources as they continue to protect members and our staff and visitors um, and the facilities of Congress. And while I believe it, we, we need to vastly improve the, how the Capitol Police operates, um, especially the Capitol Police Board, I think is absolutely paramount, paramount, these provisions are a good first step towards addressing some of the issues we've seen in the past few months. The increase received by the architect of the Capitol will serve as a foundation for future, the future of safe and welcoming Capitol campus with several new initiatives that will address most uh, critical needs of the agency and the Capitol community, including provisions in the bill, which um, I helped uh, author, is the removable, removal of accessibility barriers to make sure that everyone can come here, <laughs> that it is everybody's Capitol or the Capitol Complex and assist in reducing the spread of communicable diseases to encourage and assure our constituents that they can safely come to Washington, D.C. and meet with the people that they elected. The Library of Congress's allocation includes the final $10 million installment for the Visitor uh, Experience Initiative, which will get visitors a truly enhanced experience, connecting them with history and providing better access to its unparalleled collections. Funding will also invest in safeguarding the library's unique and ever-growing collection, expanding access to the services and the resources uh, they offer, and modernizing the library's operations and technology. While there are many provisions that I can support in this bill, it comes with a very steep 13.8% increase, uh, equating to a $580.9 million above the fiscal year 2021 level. And additionally, the majority included controversial writers uh, without consultation from the minority. Addi therefore, I cannot support this bill in its current form, but I do remain hopeful that we can continue to work together as this process moves forward. Thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, Chairman Ryan, um, and thank you to the staff, Steve Marques and Michelle Reinshuttle on our team for all that you have done to help put this bill together. And uh, with that, I yield back. Would now I'd like to recognize myself for opening remarks. 
I'd like to congratulate Congress, con con Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler uh, for producing a strong bill that meets the needs of the legislative branch. It's your dedication to these issues, your commitment to the work of the committee, this body, your unfailing battle for working people everywhere. The bill we have before us today would not be what it is without your hard work and dedication. And I want to thank everyone on both sides of the aisle uh, who have shared their input on this important effort, and I want to say a thank you to the staff. The Legislative Branch Subcommittee held 11 hearings on topics that include responding to the January 6th insurrection, the urgent needs of the Capitol Police. I participated in several of these hearings, and I'm pleased to say that the bill faithfully responds to the critical needs that were raised in those discussions, particularly as it relates to protecting our democracy by securing the Capitol. As a nation, we pride ourselves on our commitment to preserving a government of, by, and for the people. As the oldest modern democracy in the world, the United States exemplifies not only the success, but also the long-term sustainability of democratic governance. We are a beacon of hope to people suffering under the oppression of authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. And if we fail in this great experiment, and fail to sustain the pillars of democratic governance that have encouraged and inspired people around the world, then we fail to honor our sacred duty, not only to our own citizens, but to, to an America as an idea. The brutal, violent assault on the Capitol on January 6th, when many of us, whether it were members of Congress, staff, employees, visitors, people feared for their lives. The Capitol was under attack. The cradle of our democracy was under attack, and it was against liberty. It was also an attack not just against the American people, but all of those who aspire to a freer world. The brave men and women in uniform who risked their lives defending this institution understood this. This bill honors their sacrifice, gives these heroes the funding, resources, and training they need to ensure what happened on January 6th never happens again. The bill provides $603.9 million, an increase of 88.4 for our Capitol Police. It builds the force to a total of 2,112 sworn officers, 450 civilian members. And following the tragic death by suicide of Officer Howie Liebengood, it boosts support for wellness programs. In recognition of the changes the Capitol Police desperately need, this bill and the accompanying report include measures to provide more transparency, diversity, and leadership training for Capitol Police, and to standardize vetting and routinely review staff for employment suitability. While securing the Capitol must be a top priority, we must also make sure that the institution within these walls remains strong. That is why I am pleased that the bill provides increased funding for the members' representational allowance, standing, and select committees, the leadership and leadership funding to help retain and recruit a talented and a diverse workforce, and to grow opportunity to create a diverse hiring pipeline. It expands paid internships opportunities while also providing authorization for DREAMers to work in congressional offices. Together, the initiatives in this bill would not only protect the Congress and our democracy, they would strengthen and sustain it. I thank my colleagues for their impressive work, and I urge your support for this important legislation. Thank you, and I yield back, and with that, I'd like to recognize the uh, ranking member of the, uh, of the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for the work they've done to address critical issues that affect our Congress. This bill before us today takes steps to make the House of Representatives more effective, efficient, and transparent on behalf of the American people. This bill recognizes the service and sacrifice of our Capitol Police and supports the Department's evolving mission. This bill also allows the architect of the Capitol to maintain and better protect the Capitol complex, as well as promote the health and safety of the people who work and visit here. Unfortunately, I have concerns that will prevent me from supporting this bill in its current form. This bill is based on a funding framework that the majority party developed without Republican support. In fact, in this proposal, total spending for the legislative branch increases by more than 13 percent. 
If we want to fund the good things contained in this bill, we must work together to develop spending levels both sides can support. In addition, there are riders that are more appropriately addressed by other committees, specifically related to immigration policy. I'm concerned that this difference of opinion on funding priorities and on policy positions could needlessly slow down our appropriations process this year. In closing, I want to thank the subcommittee members for their work on this bill. I also want to thank the majority and minority staff, specifically our subcommittee clerk, Michelle Reinshuttle, and the majority clerk, Steve Marques. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make a general comment about the bill? I recognize Congressman Espaya. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. I rise in support of this uh, fantastic le legislative branch appropriation bill. Um, I, it also, it, it, not only does it uh, increase funds to finally address lagging uh, staff pay throughout the House, it also includes important initiatives and provisions aim at increasing diversity so our staff and our capital looks more like our diverse nation. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and yourself, uh, Madam Chair, in particular for including some of the provisions I raised as concerns during the hearings and in my request to, to the committee. In the wake of the January 6th insurrection, a few things stood out to me, uh, Madam Chair. In fact, it was right here where many members of Congress huddled as the Capitol was attacked. Right here in this very same room, members from both sides of the aisle, probably very scared for their own lives, uh, huddled right here for protection. Uh, and um, the brave men and women of the Capitol Police got us here. For one, I noticed on the morning of the 6th that there was also inadequate amount of security sweeps and patrols, particularly in areas off campus where many of us members spend time, and when we are not voting or meeting uh, our constituents in our office. So I'm grateful for the inclusion of language that directs the Capitol Police to work with the Sergeant of Arms to conduct uh, patrols in areas off campus where members tend to congregate. As you know, Madam Chair, two pipe bombs were found not too far away from here. Additionally, in the wake of January 6th, I noted many custodial staff, in fact, I saw some of them sweeping the blood off the uh, uh, chambers, out, right outside the chambers. There were uh, custodial staff of color cleaning up the mess left behind by the white supremacist mouth. Their ability to cope with such a traumatic incident troubled me greatly, especially given the unique circumstances faced by people of color in the wake of such attack. So I'm very glad the committee included directives to the Office of Employee Assistance to expand the availability of culturally competent mental health services, as well as prioritizing the employment of staff who have worked with people of diverse backgrounds and who themselves come from diverse walks of life. Finally, during our hearing earlier this year, I raised questions about the physical security of our data centers in the wake of an attack. So I'm glad the bill and report includes directives for legislative branch agencies to come up with an action plan for security agency data and secure centers outside of the national capital region. In short, as a new member of this committee and subcommittee, I am grateful for the opportunity to make important improvements to our capital complex and to services provided to members and all the staff who serve with us. This is a good bill, Madam Chair, and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Madam Chair? Well, no, I, no. Congress, is there anyone on the other side? No. Congressman Fortenberry, and then we'll move. We'll go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Chair Ryan and Ranking Member sure. Herrera Butler for the hard work here. Better? You can hear? No. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for okay. uh, recognizing me. Thank you, uh, Chair Ryan and Congresswoman Rare Butler, for the hard work here. I, I want to note uh, one particular thing in the bill, which I think is important. It's small, but it's important. I was standing in front of Longworth recently, and two patrols on horses walked by. 
And there's a quiet dignity and a calm when you see a patrol on horseback. A number of years ago, when I had the opportunity to chair this committee briefly, we actually promoted the idea of returning to the Capitol Police the, the ability for them to do horse patrols. And so I do want to thank both of you for including this in the bill, as well as the particular emphasis on the Library of Congress's uh, projects. I think that's very important. I yield back. Thank you. Madam. Congressman Aguilar. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Ryan uh, and his committee staff for including a provision that I've supported through the years. For too long, we've excluded a community of young people from the opportunity to serve as employees within the legislative branch. Despite growing up here, going to school here, starting careers and families here, DACA recipients have been denied a chance to serve in their communities through federal employment, as well as through the legislative branch. There are doctors and nurses in our communities who are on the front lines of the pandemic. There are students and teachers working hard to build a better future for our country and their first responders and service members willing to put their lives on the line. I've seen it firsthand. Laura Munoz Lopez, who is a member of my staff, was a DACA recipient before being able to adjust her status to become a citizen. Due to the archaic and unjust policy, Laura would have been denied a chance to serve here in the legislative branch while she was a DACA recipient. There are many DACA recipients just like Laura who want the opportunity and would excel in federal service but are denied the chance. This bill before, that, before us would give them that chance. And I want to thank Representative Kirkpatrick, a member of our committee who has a bill that would make this law within the legislative branch side. And this is an issue that I've been passionate, as I said. Um, and I also want to thank Chairman Quigley. Uh, this is a spoiler alert, but he's included similar language uh, for FSGG that would allow individuals with DACA status to serve government-wide whether you're a Forest Service employee or work uh, in Interior or IRS or any other federal agency, you should be afforded the opportunity uh, to work for the federal government. So I want to thank both Chairman Quigley, Chairman Ryan, and, and you, Chair DeLauro, uh, for including this. And I enthusiastically support its passage and look forward to voting aye. Thank you so much. Yield back. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Oh, I'm sorry. If I can, uh, let me move to the other side of the aisle, Congressman Rutherford. And it will go back and forth. Newhouse, I'm sorry, Congressman Newhouse. It's quite all right, Madam Chair. So, Appreciate that. Thank you very sorry. much. Um, as a member of the Legislative Branch Subcommittee, I just want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for their work on this um, piece of legislation. But I just want to make one general comment as it pertains to this and, and all of the spending. Um, bills that we're going to be considering. As we face a $28 plus trillion dollar debt in this country, um, we have got to begin the process of getting our fiscal house in order as the smallest fiscal bill that we will consider, the legislative branch, although it's important, certainly over the many of the recent events, it's very important that we address many important issues facing us. I also think it's important that we could use this as an example of the kind of fiscal responsibility that we need to show in all of the uh, appropriations bills. So uh, just a general comment there that, that we need to be cognizant of our limitations and demonstrate to the American people that we can be fiscally responsible. And with that, I would also just like to rise as a point of personal privilege. It is freezing in this room. I know I'm that you. Uh, it's probably not your fault, Madam Chair. It will keep us all awake through the long <laughs> hours that we spend today. But if anybody can do anything about the temperature, uh, I would appreciate that very much. I'm, I'm always of the view that both on the floor of the House and in these buildings, the, the rooms are freezing. So I, I believe that the person who has the most power is the person who really controls the temperature in all of the rooms. And I think collectively we ought to find that person. <laughs> Congressman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I'd like to thank the chair and the ranking member on their leadership of this sub subcommittee. I am pleased to see that the FY 2022 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill provides meaningful increase in the operation of the, of the House. These investments look after the well-being and the mental health of our staff, 
which is now important, more important than ever before, following the January 6th insurrection. I am also pleased that funding has increased to ensure members can hire, retain, and build effective and efficient staff to serve the needs of our constituents. I'm also encouraged by the inclusion of some of my language requests, including culturally competent training at the Office of Employee Assistance, which is critical towards supporting our diverse staff on the Hill. The new funding included for committee interns also demonstrates our commitment that paid internships are a necessity towards opening career pathways for marginalized populations. And I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for working to reflect my priorities into this bill. This institution will be well served by the robust, robust funding, opening pathways and support systems for staff of color, and a focus on strengthening our workforce will only allow the House to better live up to its name, the House of the People. I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back. Thank you. Congresswoman Barbara Lee. But thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Bryan, and our ranking member, uh, Herrera Butler, for your uh, tremendous leadership on this Ledge Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, and also for your staff for their very hard and diligent work. Uh, and also to both uh, Chairwoman DeLauro and ranking member uh, Granger, thank you so much. I'm pleased uh, that the Fiscal 22 Ledge Branch Appropriations Bill includes many important provisions that I am very proud to support. I thank the Chairman for including a feasibility study to set up a stipend program to support interns from underrepresented backgrounds, including those who attend HBCUs, tribal colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, and other minority serving institutions. Now, I know how cost prohibitive a congressional in internship and job can be. The cost of living in the nation's capital makes it extremely difficult for young people from low-income communities and communities of color to participate in internship opportunities. Just a personal story very quickly. A few years ago uh, in the day, I uh, wanted to be an intern. I was in college raising two small sons by myself as a single mom. I really wanted to come to Washington, D.C. as an intern, but um, it was very difficult. And so I received one dollar an hour from a work-study program at my college to come here to Washington, D.C. to work for our beloved, the late Congressman Ron Dellums. But had I not had a family um, who supported me through this period, my life would have been uh, on a different trajectory. And so these internships for young students of color uh, is extremely important, and they need that support. So it's unfortunate, but not a lot has changed since the day. So I thank Chairman Ryan for making sure that uh, we have this feasibility study, and I hope that we get this done very quickly because we're losing a lot of talent. I know many, many young people who would love to be here uh, to do exactly what many of us did in the day. Uh, also, thank you for the, the um, diversity workforce piece in this bill uh, in terms of increasing diversity, uh, excuse me, increasing funding for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as a number of reports requiring the House to evaluate racial and gender pay disparities to identify and maintain diverse talent pipelines and to improve disaggregated demographic data collection across Capitol Hill. Again, uh, I just have to say, as a former staffer of the late Ron Dellums, uh, and one of only a handful of black women staff on Capitol Hill that time, during that time, I personally know how extremely important the value of representation and diversity means here on the Hill and in our district offices in terms of public service. Thank you again uh, for including many of these provisions in the bill. Congresswoman Clark. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for all your incredible work on putting together this bill. Uh, there is so much that we have to celebrate on increased efficiency and modernization and the ability to meet the increased demands and needs of our constituents. And I especially want to thank you for how you have put equity as a through line throughout this bill. 
um, whether it's the work you did with me on having dreamers be able and DACA recipients be able to work in our offices to making sure that we are including potential childcare reimbursement and staff benefits. And as my colleague already mentioned, expanding mental health care so that we meet the needs of the people who work in our capital community. I appreciate your work on security and all the hearings, uh, getting to the facts of what happened leading up to the insurrection on January 6th and how we can help the Capitol Police uh, secure our community moving forward. This is a good bill. I am very proud of the work of my colleagues that went into it, and I urge all members of the committee to support it. Thank you, and I yield back. Congresswoman Kaptur. Yes, um, I am compelled to rise to thank uh, Chairman Ryan and uh, Ranking Member Herrera Butler for their fine work on this bill. I just wanted to mention a couple items I think others would agree. Uh, the dignified uh, pay and competitive wages, at least inching up a little bit to find a way to do that better here. Uh, acknowledgement of the phenomenal job that our Capitol Police have done. Uh, they defended us and at uh, great personal sacrifice. We recognize that and respect it. Uh, I wanted to compliment uh, also the chair and ranking member for their inclusion of additional attention to the Open World Leadership Program and the importance of the greatest library in the world, the Library of Congress, uh, aiding developing democracies around the world and using some of the fine talents of members of Congress and linking to parliaments by Zoom and uh, by exchanges, uh, building on the old Open World Program. What a step forward for the Congress of the United States uh, as a model, uh, sometimes flawed, but nonetheless a very important model of a diverse country being able to govern itself. Uh, also, uh, the inclusion in the bill of a call to the U.S. Botanic Gardens uh, to help expand education and outreach programs to urban public gardens across this country, uh, especially those that are urban food challenged. Uh, it's a great national model, and it can have an enormous influence at very low cost across this country. And uh, finally, as chair of the Energy and Water Committee, I'm so pleased that this bill includes uh, direction to the architect of the Capitol to embark on the very first ever energy audit of the Capitol complex. Someone just commented on how cool the air is in here today. Uh, and uh, to be a world leader in energy efficiencies, uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, the Congress leveraged the energy technologies uh, in this region uh, and make a difference here in the legislative branch? So congratulations, uh, Congressman Ryan, Chairman Ryan, and uh, Ranking Member uh, Herrera Butler for your fine job on this bill. I urge member support and yield back. Are there any other members wishing to speak or make general comments about the bill? Seeing no other member wishing to uh, make any general comments on the bill, I'd like to recognize Mr. Ryan to offer a manager's amendment. The clerk, oh, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, I rise to offer a manager's amendment. I ask unanimous uh, consent to dispense with the reading. Okay. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Mr. Ryan is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment has been agreed to on both sides, but I do want to note uh, with the reference to being cold in here that I think the people from northern Ohio, upper Midwest, are not cold. <laughs> See, the gentleman from Cleveland doesn't even have a jacket on. So I apologize to all the fragile people from northwestern part of the <laughs> country. From the eastern from, East from Coast. The as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this bipartisan manager's amendment will add nine technical changes. As I said, it's been agreed to on both sides. Nine technical changes, two bill items, and one report language addition. First, we are making certain amounts of overtime pay earned by officers of the U.S. Capitol Police creditable as basic pay for retirement. Under the current law, an officer's overtime earnings do not count towards his or her retirement annuity. Over the course of a year, each officer can be required, as we've seen over the past few months, required to work overtime worth up to $25,000. But these earnings are left out of the calculation for their retirement annuity, despite making up a fairly large component of total compensation. 
This stands in contrast with over 50 other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies that do count overtime earnings as part of base pay for retirement purposes. This disparity is a key impediment to recruiting and retaining Capitol Police officers. Our bill makes these corrections and would immediately help the Capitol Police retain the more than 500 officers who will be eligible to retire in the next five years while also serving as an important recruitment tool to bring in the next generation of qualified officers. I'm proud we can take this change or make this change in the fiscal year 22 bill to ensure our Capitol Police officers receive the full compensation they deserve upon retirement. Secondly, the amendment provides a one and a half million dollars for deacidification preservation at the Library of Congress. These funds will add to the funds from fiscal year 2021 and be made available for three years as we continue to phase out and retire this program. Lastly, we have added a report language to further the library's work in the archival and preservation of Central and Eastern European collections. The language encourages the library to work with other agencies and museums to capture and preserve the stories of these immigrants over the past 75 years. Again, the minority had no issues with these additions. Once again, I urge support of this amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. Ranking Member Herrera Butler is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment address. No, 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 on the, on the manager's amendment. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members who wish to speak on the manager's amendment? Mr. Ryan, do you need a minute to close? Good. Okay. The question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Yeah. Sufficient? Uh, to, okay. No. Recorded vote. Okay. So the amendment is adopted. Wait a minute. Oh. Will do. Well, the, the manager's amendment is adopted. Right now, we're going to recognize. Yes, I, get, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. This, I, uh, Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now have an amendment at the desk. Okay. Mm -hmm. I ask that the what? amendment be considered as read. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members and staff working here in the Congress, um, we all owe a debt of gratitude to the officers of the Capitol Police Department and the DC Metropolitan Police for the heroic actions on January 6th, and quite frankly, every day. Those men and women stood fearlessly in front of the Capitol, vastly outnumbered and under-equipped, and defended us, Republicans and Democrats, <laughs> from rioters who attempted to prevent us from executing our constitutional duty. What they endured that day was not a typical protest. It was a violent mob who intended to inflict harm on them and members of Congress. They endured relentless assaults from rioters using pipes, flagpoles, bear spray, mace, and other weapons. I had an officer share with me how it felt to be beaten with a flagpole with a Blue Lives Matter flag on it. They suffered serious physical injuries and it took an emotional toll um, that's gonna stay with them for the rest of their lives. They deserve to be honored for their sacrifice. My amendment is very simple. It would direct the architect of the Capitol to erect a plaque at a permanent location on the western front of the Capitol to immortalize the names of the men and the women of the United States Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police Department, who served and defended the Capitol that day. The Committee on House Administration and the, Senate, the Committee on Rules in the Senate would also be directed to jointly compile a list of names of those who should be included on that plaque, in addition to those who are listed in the amendment that should be at your desks. Take a minute and look at the names. I have been in close contact with members of both police departments in the aftermath of January 6th in the drafting of this amendment, and I intend to work closely with the Committee on House Administration to ensure that all those who served that day are honored. Madam Chair, we should never forget their courage. Establishing a plaque 
to immortalize the names of the men and women of the Metropolitan Police Department and the U.S. Capitol Police who served on January 6th on the very grounds they defended will be a stark and permanent reminder of the sacrifice those individuals made that day. Let me say that the U.S. Capitol Police and the Metropolitan, uh, to the U.S. Capitol Police and to the Metropolitan Police here, we see you. We acknowledge you. We are grateful to you. That's all this amendment is about. I ask for support from my colleagues for this amendment, and I yield back. Congressman Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the ranking member. I rise in support of this amendment as we near the six-month mark of January 6th. None of us will forget the events of that day. We owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the brave men and women of the Capitol Police who risked their lives that day. I believe this entire bill is a thank you, but I think it is entirely appropriate. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Rare Butler for, for making sure that, that we have something here in the Capitol that will memorialize uh, in the names of the, the men and women who protected us on that day. And also a reminder to do the work that will allow that never to happen again here. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Herrera Butler and her team for uh, putting this together and making this a priority. I fully support it, uh, this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Congresswoman Granger, do you wish to speak on the? Do you wish to speak on the amendment? No, okay. Let me just, uh, and I will recognize folks in, in, in a second. I want to support this amendment by Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Uh, it's really recognition of the Capitol Police. Uh, speaking to them even now after the uh, January 6th insurrection was, uh, there really is a sense of demoralization that they are out there by themselves. And they need to know um, that we honor their commitment, their sacrifices, their families uh, that made that day uh, and every day, uh, and that we are going to provide them with the resources they, they need. They really stood steadfast in the wake of danger. And I recall myself being evacuated from the House Gallery and the Capitol Police were there, you know, to make sure that we got out safely. Um, and uh, uh, we all applaud them. Uh, Louder? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lois. <laughs> um, as, as Chairman Ryan mentioned, we look forward to working with the ranking member uh, to fine tune the language as we move forward and with the legislative process. But thank you so much uh, for offering the amendment and uh, look forward to uh, achieving, um, uh, 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 achieving it and also achieving unanimous support. So thank you. Uh, are there members who wish to speak on this amendment? Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. We have so many things that we struggle to support. We're even talking about the monuments and the photos and the um, portraits that are in this place of our national government. A day in history was written on January the 6th, and generations after us will sit back and evaluate, judge, and have their turn on it. But when people come to this Capitol, we make a concerted effort to recognize those who have given their lives, those who have led. And for me, uh, I'm 100% with you, Congresswoman. I think this is the appropriate thing to do, and I stand in support of it. And it's not to remember the horror but it is to, re, to really honor the service of not only the officer whose name will be on that plaque, but all the officers who served at that time. And what better time for us to come together but in a room that we saw one of the most bipartisan days that if incidents and occasions that I've seen on, the, on this hill was when we all ran for our lives and we all were praying that we would survive and our democracy would survive. So I support and I yield back. Any other members wishing to be heard? Congresswoman Wexton. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, Congresswoman Wexton. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I would, I would ask if the, the proponent of the amendment would yield for a question. Would the yes. gentlewoman yield for a question? Yes. Time, but yes. Yes. 
Now, I'm just curious how, how the names were determined for this, for this uh, amendment, because I noticed that there's only maybe 35 Capitol Police officers, and I can think of a number of them off the top of my head who are well, not included in this list. We, uh, well, part of the reason it's written is, is so we work with the Capitol Police and with the Metro PD, and specifically the goal was um, everybody who served on that day, the West Front. And so part of the reason that, and that's where we hope this would be, um, it was one of the areas where it was, you know, five hours plus, and they were unable to penetrate there because officers kept reinforcing themselves. Um, so that was really, those are the number, those were the names that were given to us from the Capitol Police and from the Metro PD, but we have left it, um, it open enough for further revision for more names, because we don't want, the goal isn't to leave anybody out, so. But it was in working with Capitol Police. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair, may I speak to the amendment briefly? Yes. Thank you. Recognized. I, I, just, I just would like to caution us that, that if we do, you know, if we do create this plaque that we don't leave anybody out. Because as I mentioned, I, could, I can think of three people off the top of my head who are not included. One being my constituent, Howie Liebengood, who, who served valiantly at the, cap, at the Capitol and the Senate side that day and ultimately died by suicide several days later. Um, Inspector Tom Lloyd, who is in charge of the Capitol Division and was there fighting alongside the, the, the lower ranking officers, you know, would, a number would, of officers. Would the gentlelady yield? Um, I would love to kind of our staff and you and I to sit down specifically and go over this because there has been hours and hours and hours of kind of, um, of input on this and maybe uh, offer you the opportunity. It might provide a clearer picture. Um, the goal wasn't absolutely everybody involved because that was impossible, but I can provide for you kind of why the Capitol Police provided us the names that they did. Um, and and there, certainly as we move into the next phase, if you want to look at, you know, changes or additions to work with the Capitol Police and do that, I'm totally open to that. But it's, I understand why you're asking the questions you are because these are your constituents. Um, and I want to ally any concerns that you have, but there are I don't know that I could answer it right here, right now, with the whole scope because it's a pretty big process as we've been working with Capitol Police and with Metro PD. I thank the gentlewoman, and I would love to participate in that with her because a third third person I was thinking of is Officer Justin Moore, who had been stationed at the Library of Congress and was called over to reinforce reinforce the, the folks at the Capitol, and ultimately was struck by a uh, by an insurrectionist with a metal pipe and broke a broke one of his vertebrae. So I think that all of those people should be recognized. We don't want to leave anybody out. Let's let's work together on this. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. I think it's well said that we won't, don't want to leave anyone out of that. So that further conversations. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Yes, I just want to. I, I'm going to support this because I think it's important that we have this memorialization as well as other things which we have not uh, succeeded in um, passing on behalf of all these officers who were under understaffed, underprepared, but every one of them was a hero. And I really need to understand the criteria for the selection of the number of, that, of the names that, are, that will be on the plaque. I also wonder if we just ought not have, not have a plaque that memorializes all the heroes that were on that day in, in general, and maybe have some sort of um, just a running, running account of all the officers that served because everybody that was there protecting us on January the 6th was challenged by being underprepared, on um, lack of intelligence, um, and they fought for us and none of us and not any of our staff uh, lost their lives on that day but for each and every one of those heroes. And I just want to figure out a way that we acknowledge that. And I yield back, I thank you. Any other members who wish to speak on this amendment? If there's no further debate, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute to close. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's comments. I'm happy to share with you all of the information that I have as I've been working with Capitol Police, Metro PD, and quite frankly, leaderships on both sides and um, uh, house admin to try and do the best thing possible um, to bring recognition 
uh, to those folks uh, who've really, I think, saved our bacon. So goal isn't to leave anybody out. Goal is to get as much recognition as possible. I'm happy to share that with you as we move forward. And having said that, um, I, would, I would urge the amendment's adoption because I think I haven't seen anything like this yet. And I think we need to move forward and prove we can do it in a bipartisan way. So with that, I yield back. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Washington State. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Continue the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Okay. Is there any further amendment or discussion? Seeing, seeing none, I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support for this bill. Madam Chair, I move to favorably report the Legislative Branch Appropriations Act 2022 to the House. Questions on the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, please raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. <coughs> Mr. Case. Aye. Mr. Case, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Klein. No. Mr. Klein, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Christ. Aye. Mr. Christ, aye. Mr. Quayer. Aye. Mr. Quayer, aye. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. diaz Bellart. No. Mr. diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat, aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Ms. Frankel. Aye. Ms. Frankel, aye. Mr. Garcia. No. Mr. Garcia, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. No. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mrs. Hinson. No. Mrs. Hinson, no. Mr. Joyce. No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Kaptur. Aye. Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Aye. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California, aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada, aye. Ms. McCullum. Ms. McCullum, aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mr. Rententhaler. Mr. Rententhaler. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger, aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone, aye. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood, aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. 
Mrs. Watson Coleman, aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos, aye. Does any member wish to uh, change their vote or have their vote recorded? The clerk will tally. Mr. Espiat, have you been recorded? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. On this vote, the yeas are 33, the nays are 25, uh, and the motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill and report uh, of the report just approved. Seeing no objection, so ordered. So ordered. Thank you. Okay. Let, let me remind people that there is lunch in room 1036, which is downstairs, and we will transition uh, quickly here to uh, begin the undertaking of financial services. bring food
Hey, what's your talking points for uh, the motions for you for later today? As a okay, so. yeah, I will. What time?
Yeah, once they see you. Our final order of business today is the consideration of the Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2022. I will now recognize Mr. Quigley to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today the committee will mark up the fiscal year 2022 bill. There's nobody here, so. Can you hear us now? I think you have to speak loud, Mike. Check. That's, Check. What, that's what I'm understanding. Is there another one besides this one? Is this over on the side? Oh, oh, under, underneath here. I'll get it for you, Mike. There you go. Take two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today, the committee will mark up fiscal year 2022 bill. In a moment, I'll talk about the mark itself, but first I'd like to thank staff on both sides for their efforts in drafting this bill and preparing for this markup. On the majority staff of the committee, that includes Laura, Mary Beth, Elliot, Alok, Parker, and Matt, and my own staff, Charlie, and for the minority, John Martins. I want to sincerely thank my friend and colleague, Mr. Romack, for his hard work and collaboration on this bill. I know we may not agree on everything, but I appreciate his partnership in developing the best possible bill during this challenging time. I'd also like to thank the chair of the full committee, Ms. DeLauro, for her tremendous leadership and stewardship on the committee, as well as the committee's distinguished ranking member, Ms. Granger. The agencies and programs under the jurisdiction of the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee are uniquely varied. Each one plays an important role in the functioning of our government whether in terms of core services or in relation to government responsiveness, transparency, and efficiency. The subcommittee was able to hold a full hearing schedule this year, though due to the pandemic, these hearings were virtual. In these hearings, we were able to explore issues facing, facing agencies funded in this bill so that we were able to have an informed conversation about their appropriations. <clears throat> the mark recommends $29 billion. This is an increase of $4.8 billion above the comparable fiscal year 2021 level. The bill includes $13.6 billion for the IRS, an increase of $1.7 billion above fiscal year 2021, and a bold first step toward restoring the significant cuts this agency has suffered for almost a decade. This much-needed investment will support more effective and efficient enforcement activities that equally address taxpayers in all tax brackets. This funding will also better support customer service by reducing wait times and increasing assistance to those trying to navigate the complex tax code. Notably, the bill includes $330 million for community development financial institutions, which is $60 million above fiscal year 2021. I've long been a supporter of CDFIs, which provide critical resources to underserved communities. In addition, in addition, the bill provides $324 million for the Small Business Administration's Entrepreneurial Development Programs, which is $32 million above fiscal year 2021 level. These grant programs provide much needed and targeted assistance to small businesses to expand and create additional jobs. The bill includes significant funding for the GSA, including a significant investment to combat climate change, a new $300 million electric vehicles fund, which will both replace vehicles in the GSA fleet with electric vehicles and build electrical vehicle infrastructure. The bill also provides $100 million for GSA to provide and manage climate change risk and safeguard federal real property along with over $1 billion to modernize and improve the GSA real property portfolio by reducing their climate impact and improving resiliency. The bill also includes funding for programs to combat the opioid epidemic under the Office of the National Drug Control Policy to ensure this crisis receives the highest level of federal attention it deserves. Specifically, $300 million is included for the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program an increase of $10 million above fiscal year 2021. 
and Drug Free Communities Program is funded at $110 million. In lead up to the 250th anniversary of our country in 2026, the bill includes much needed funding for modernization of the National Archives building, which houses the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. These funds will be used to enhance security efforts and the visitor experience to the archives. The bill includes $8.15 billion in discretionary appropriations for the judicial branch, an increase of $432 million over fiscal year 2021 to fund protective services and physical security needs in courthouses and to ensure the continued operations of the judiciary. The bill increases funding for agencies that protect everyday consumers and retail investors, Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Security and Exchange Commission, agencies that are relatively small but absolutely essential. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to highlight an issue that has been a priority, election security. States that are on the front lines are protecting our elections from foreign attacks, and it is our responsibility to support these efforts. The bill before us today includes $500 million for payments to states to help them meet the challenge of ensuring the real security and integrity of American elections. This represents our continued commitment to long-term funding for election security. I urge all my colleagues to join me in advancing this critical investment. The bill includes $22.8 million for the Election Assistance Commission, a 34 percent increase to support state and local election officials on all aspects of election administration and ensure reliable, secure, and accessible elections. The bill takes seriously the broader cyber threat to this country. It provides $15 million for a new office of the National Cyber Security Director in the Executive Office of the President to help coordinate federal cybersecurity policy and strategy and make strong investments throughout the bill in agency cybersecurity and IT modernization. I am also proud that the bill removes several long-standing policy riders that I consider to be harmful, include many that dictate to the district how to manage its own affairs or spend its own money, or that harm transparency and political spending. I am pleased with the many ways in which this bill stands to improve the lives of the American public, whether by improving their tax filing experience, protecting their financial investments, promoting small business creation, combating drug trafficking, and the climate crisis. So I look forward to discussing these issues more in today's markup. I thank the Chair and I yield back. I would now like to recognize the Ranking Member of the Subcommittee, Mr. Womack. And thank you so much for your wonderful jam and jelly here. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, it is truly an honor to serve on this committee. And this will be my first markup, having spent a little time over on the Budget Committee uh, as ranker and chair there uh, before coming back and graciously accepting the assignment given to me by our ranking member, Kay Granger. And I wanted this day to include a little taste from home, so that's why we brought some preserves and some jellies, some apple butter from the House of Webster. I, I give the shout out to the House of Webster in Rogers, Arkansas, knowing that Hal Rogers will, t will, will believe that their city was named after him, but um, it was actually a different Rogers. Uh, and, and for those of you that had asked specifically about different flavors, I think we have several of each of them remaining, so please help yourself. And I want the principal staff to know how much we appreciate them, and I want you guys also to help yourself to a little taste from Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Chairman Quigley. Every appropriator who sits in a leadership position should have the same experience that I'm having with Chairman Quigley. We have a great open relationship. We communicate frequently via text, via telephone, and it's a, just a wonderful thing. I, I, I'm, I'm honored that you would be willing to work with me in the manner that you do, and Mike, I, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. In a normal year, it can be hard to put together an appropriations bill. However, this year the process has been much harder because the administration did not submit its budget request until Memorial Day weekend. There are a lot of reasons for that, uh, but it doesn't diminish the fact that we have a very late start. 
I'm grateful the chairman included many priorities from Rep Republican members and address several bipartisan provisions such as helping small business, combating cybercrime, and supporting anti-drug programs such as the drug-free communities and the high-intensity drug trafficking program. Unfortunately, however, as currently drafted, the bill's uncontrolled baseline spending isn't justified and ignores our unsustainable fiscal trajectory. It also includes several controversial policy changes and riders that will be very difficult for us to support. I was hoping that in fiscal 22 we would start making the tough choices necessary to chart a responsible fiscal path forward. Instead, on the heels of unprecedented pandemic spending, this bill proposes a 20 percent increase in discretionary spending over fiscal 21. I believe it's important to address the needs of our nation, but I also believe it has to be done in a very responsible way and in the context of all of the money from CARES forward that we have thrown at the pandemic. Numerous agencies funded in the bill receive a double-digit percentage increase over last year. We should be closely examining agency needs versus the wants instead of providing such extravagant increases. We're also seeing the inflation and historically high debt ushered by the administration's excessive spending. I'm greatly concerned these realities will hinder recovery and burden future generations of Americans. There are also several controversial policy changes included in the bill, such as allowing D.C. tax dollars to fund abortions and removing the prohibition on federal employee health benefits funding abortions. While I can't support the bill as written, I do remain committed to working with my colleagues to amend the bill. My goal remains securing a bipartisan and bicameral agreement on spending and eliminating controversial policy changes. So let's work collectively to reach a strong deal and show the American people that Congress is capable of doing its job. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. I recognize myself in support of the bill. I want to congratulate Chairman Quigley and Ranking Member Womack on this bill. Thank you for your hard work, for facilitating an orderly, productive process aimed at meeting the needs of the American people, ensuring our country is safe, strong, and moving forward. Uh, for far too long, the American economy has, has catered to the very rich and corporate interests, left the middle class, small businesses, and the vulnerable, vulnerable behind which is why I'm proud that this bill takes important steps to get our nation back on track, creating those good jobs, growing opportunity, protecting that middle class and the vulnerable, indeed leveling the playing field in the face of big corporations too prone to predatory practices. There is no greater example of how the deck is stacked against hardworking people than the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. After a period of disinvestment, the IRS simply does not have the resources to enforce tax laws on big corporations and the wealthy or help the average citizen navigate the tax system, which is why I'm pleased this bill provides $13.6 billion for the operation of the IRS, renews tax enforcement efforts to crack down on tax cheats and begin repairing a broken customer service system that leaves behind hardworking Americans who are just trying to follow the law. Uh, in the lurch. The funding will allow for the successful implementation of an expanded and improved and now monthly child tax credit, uh, something that has been of a priority uh, for myself. Uh, and the historic expansion of the tax credit creates a lifeline to the middle class, and it cuts child poverty in half. We need to make that expansion and improvement uh, to the tax credit permanent. Um, let me also mention with regard to the child tax credit, lifting uh, millions of children out of poverty in my own district, it would lift, uh, uh, it benefits 110,000 kids. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, make sure that, uh, and again, that this, is, that this is permanent. In addition to facilitating the expansion of the child tax credit, this bill helps small business owners by providing an increase of $111.9 billion for the Small Business Administration, an increase of $60 million for the Community Development Financial Institutions, $26 million for the Women's Business Centers, 
It's crucial, especially since women have been the hardest hit by the economic and workforce effects of the pandemic. Together, these are critical investments that provide the credit that our underserved communities desperately need. We are a nation of businesses that employ so many working people that we must ensure they have the resources and the support they need to recover and rebuild from the devastation of the pandemic. Just a few weeks ago, I attended the reopening uh, of a club in New Haven called Toad's Place. It was encouraging, it's a, it, it was it's a music venue, encouraging to see how this business, which faced the challenges presented by the pandemic, bounced back and has successfully reopened. With the funding in this bill, we will ensure that restaurants, small businesses are able to come back, give more workers an income and jobs, and push us to grow to growth that can raise wages. Leveling the playing field for working families and the vulnerable means cracking down on corporate practices that prey on consumers. This legislation allows Americans to have more confidence in the products they purchase because we provide $172 million for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And through an increase of $39 million for the Federal Trade Commission, this bill cracks down on unfair corporate practices. The past five years have also illustrated just how vulnerable our democracy is to foreign interference, and this legislation helps protect the security and integrity of our democracy with $500 million for election security grants to states. And as climate change continues impacting our country and the world, the legislation launches the transition to a clean federal vehicle fleet by providing $300 million for the electric vehicle fund. I'm proud of this bill. It takes important steps to invest in America's working families and small businesses. I urge my colleagues to support it, and I thank you. And with that, let me recognize uh, the ranking member of the committee, Congresswoman Granger, for her remarks. Nice, Chairman Quigley and Ranking Member Womack for their work on putting this financial services bill together. Excuse me. In many cases, the bill before us reflects priorities of members on both sides of the aisle, such as support for small business, drug control programs, and counterterrorism and financial intelligence efforts. However, I'm concerned that there are several controversial items included in the bill related to immigration policy, union activities, and school choice for low-income students in the District of Columbia. It is also disappointing that the bill does not include long-standing pro-life provisions regarding the use of D.C. local funds and the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. Regardless of where one stands on the issue of abortion, a recent poll suggests the majority of Americans agree that they do not want their tax dollars used to fund them. In addition to these policy concerns, the overall funding level in the bill is simply too high, with many agencies receiving double-digit percentage increases. After a year of staggering levels of spending and the pandemic now nearing an end, we should be looking for ways to address our growing national debt Instead, this bill increases the size and reach of the federal government. In order for our work to produce real results in the end, we need to work together to reach a bipartisan budget agreement and reject controversial policy changes. With just less than 100 days left before the end of the fiscal year, we have no time to waste. In closing, I'd like to thank all the subcommittee members and the staff for their hard work on this bill. Specifically, my minority leader, my minority clerk, John Martins, and the majority clerk, Matt Smith. I look forward to addressing this bill today and urge my colleagues to consider the amendments our side will offer. I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Are there any other members that wishing to speak on, on, on the general bill? Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank, I want to thank Chairman Quigley and Ranking Member Womack for your leadership on this bill, which funds domestic programs that will boost small businesses, protect consumers, and safeguard our elections. 
Small businesses in the United States employ half of the nation's workforce, creating two out of every three jobs. As we begin the long march towards recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that small businesses are still struggling. I'm proud that this bill increases funding for SBA programs like small business development centers and community financial development institutions that can provide relief to underserved small business owners. I'm also glad this bill takes in bold action to address the climate crisis by providing $300 million for the electric vehicle fund so we can transform the entire federal vehicle fleet, including the USPS fleet. Finally, I'm thrilled that this bill makes it a priority to reduce the number of injuries and deaths associated with pools and spas. First, the bill provides an increase from $1.3 million to $2 million for the Virginia Graham Baker Grant Program. These grants assist state and local governments with education, training, and enforcement of pool, pool safety requirements. They also serve as a powerful incentive for states and municipalities to increase their own pool safety laws on the books. This grant program was created by the Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act, our nation's first pool safety law that I had the honor of, of sponsoring a number of years ago. I've advocated for pool safety laws since the start of my career in public service, and it remains an issue near and dear to my heart. Unfortunately, today, we still have the number one killer of children under five years old and the number two killer of children under 14 years old nationally due to accidental death. In other words, totally preventable death is drowning in swimming pools. And that is something that we can really do something about if we put obstacles in the path of a child so that when supervision lapses, we have a fail-safe to protect them. Drownings and near drownings in pools and spas continue to pose a significant public health risk to our nation's children. Sadly, the Consumer Product Safety Commission data from June 2021 demonstrates that there's an increase in pool or spa-related fatal drowning incidents among children younger than 15 years old. And this epi epidemic disproportionately affects low-income low and minority children. But fortunately, we're not helpless in the face of these dangers. The bill directs the CPSC to increase funding for their highly successful Pool Safely Education and Awareness Campaign, a safety education program designed to reduce child drownings and prevent fatalities from drain entrapments. Since we passed the VGB law, there has not been a single suction drain in, in, entrapment accident, due, uh, entrapment death due to getting caught in a pool drain since we, since we passed this law. And that's really incredibly important, the kind of progress that we can make when we work together to protect people who can't protect themselves. I look forward to seeing this bill come to the House floor. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> As there are four votes on the floor, what I'm going to do now is that the committee will be in re... Oh, yes, Co Congressman Rogers. What I was going to do is there are four votes on the floor, and what we would do is to recess until the beginning of the next vote series, which would allow people to be able to, able to speak. I think we're down to almost no time on the clock. Is that right? There's one minute left on the, on, on, on for the first vote. We'll go vote and then come back and then we will, we will resume. And I know Mr. Rogers wants to speak and Congresswoman Lee wants to speak. Is that it?
Welcome to order. We are going to resume a debate and discussion on the um, financial services bill. Uh, where we left off was that it was uh, recognizing Congressman Rogers for his comments on the general bill. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I rise today to uh, thank Chairman Quigley and Ranking Member Womack for a lot of work on this bill, especially as it pertains to the resources for counter-drug programs. As many of you know, my district was ground zero for the uh, opioid crisis a dozen years ago. And from the start, I've advocated for a comprehensive, holistic approach to address the crisis. We can't arrest our way out of the problem. We can't uh, educate our way out of the problem. And you can't treat your way out of the problem. You've got to do all three a long time, consistently and persistently. That's why I'm pleased that this bill includes $3 million for the drug courts, which really works. Uh, since uh, 1989, Drug courts have provided countless addicted Americans referral to treatment and a life-saving alternative to incarceration. When I first started my program called Operation Unite in 2003, there were only five drug courts in my entire district, which is the east third of the state. I can't hear Today we have one in all 30 counties, and those volunteer judges are changing more lives than ever before. The recent rise in opioid overdose deaths yeah. is a painful reminder that this fight is not over. Though we have a long road ahead, strong funding for programs like drug courts, drug-free communities, and high-intensity drug trafficking areas in this bill will make a difference in this fight and will save lives. I'm also pleased to see language uh, included directing the National Personnel Records Center to, turn to, to return to full staffing levels and operational hours immediately. Records at NPRC are required for veterans to receive GI Bill education benefits, VA loans, medical benefits, disability compensation, burial benefits, and other important services. Despite receiving $50 million in emergency funding to address difficulties during the COVID-19 pandemic, NPRC has a backlog of over 500,000 records requests. In my own district, one of my constituents was unable to be buried at Mill Springs Battlefield National Cemetery because NPRC took three weeks to process the required paperwork. This was two weeks too late. This veteran was instead buried at a private gravesite against his wishes and without any military presentation. Our veterans deserve better, and it's imperative NPRC return to full operations and address this backlog right now. Despite these provisions, I unfortunately can't support this bill that's currently written due to the bill's excessive funding levels and several partisan policy writers. I'm particularly concerned about language included in the bill that would provide safe harbor to financial institutions working with marijuana businesses. There are serious public health issues that need to be addressed before changing these regulations. And I hope we can work together in a bipartisan way to address these issues as we continue to move through the process on this bill. Thank you, and I yield back. <laughs> I think there are members who are having difficulty hearing. 
uh, the proceedings here. So I'm just going to ask members, when you speak, speak directly into the microphone uh, and have a loud voice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a loud voice. I encourage everyone because I think people are having trouble uh, hearing what, what's happening. With that, let me recognize Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me thank Chairman uh, Quigley and Ranking Member Womack for their leadership and for spearheading um, this appropriations bill. Uh, the fiscal 2022 fiscal ser financial services and general government appropriations bill includes many important provisions that I'm very proud to support. I'm glad that many discriminatory policy riders that have been removed from this bill, such as the ban on the use of funds for needle exchange programs, marijuana, and reproductive health care are included. This bill lifts the ban on the use of local funds, mind you, local funds in Washington, D.C. for abortion services. As the co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus, the lifting of this ban is a critical step in ensuring that the 55,000 D.C. women of reproductive age enrolled in Medicaid have access to the abortion care that has been previously pushed out of their reach. For the first time, this bill removes the discriminatory Hyde Amendment language which prohibits access to abortion services for individuals under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. Barring D.C. from using its own funds not only blatantly disregards the rights of D.C. residents, but like all abortion coverage bans, it disproportionately impacts women of color and low-income women. No women, no one should be limited in their ability to access their constitutional right to an abortion based on their income or zip code. Let me be very clear, this is also a racial justice and equity issue that must be reversed. Also, 2% uh, of the population in the District of Columbia has been diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, which fits the criteria of an epidemic. As founder and co-chair of the HIV AIDS Caucus, I'm glad to see that 5 million was included for HIV testing, education, and treatment in the District of Columbia to help reduce the spread of HIV and AIDS. In addition, I serve as co-chair of the Bipartisan Cannabis Caucus, and I'm very glad to see that this bill includes language that would prohibit any of the appropriated funds from being used to penalize financial institutions for providing financial services to businesses that participate in the legal, mind you, the legal marijuana industry in their state or locality. It also encourages OMB to review its policies on hiring and firing employees who use uh, cannabis in their private life whether for medical or adult use in states with state legal cannabis. Finally, uh, thank you for including the language that I worked on to include advancing racial equity. And that's been included in the report. This will urge OMB to provide data within federal agencies on race, gender, and other democratic, demographic uh, categories. That's the only way we will know and have a complete picture and move toward true equity. I look forward to moving this bill forward, and I thank the chair and ranking member once again. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Congressman Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise today in support of funding the bill. I want to thank Chairman Quigley for his hard work on this and Ranking Member Womack also for his hard work and also to all of the staff for, uh, for putting all your efforts into this. Um, I also want to thank you for including several provisions that we've uh, requested, whether it's Bureau of Prisons retention bonuses, Bureau of Prisons direct hire authority, um, our All-American Flag uh, Act report language, incredibly meaningful bill, uh, bill language preserving six-day and rural mail delivery, bill language preventing consolidation or closure of small rural um, or other post offices, um, our small business development centers funding. So thank you very much for including that. The one I'd like to speak out a little bit in more detail on is my Small Business Succession Planning Act that's included as part of this legislation. Uh, we've got um, almost 58% of business owners who do not have a succession plan in order to pass their business when they retire um, or when they move on to other opportunities or pass away. They don't have a provision for what comes next. 
Um, in 2015, about a third of small business closures were due to retirement, to illness, to death. And when our small businesses closed down, it cost the entire co uh, community. So I want to give a couple examples. In the, in the town of Galena, Illinois, I think it's the most beautiful part of the state of Illinois, one of the most beautiful parts in the entire nation. It's part of the district that I serve. What happened is after COVID-19 hit, we had the owner of a company called the Galena Canning Company. Um, the owner died and didn't have a succession plan. So what happened is his young son, Max, who was out in New York City, had to leave New York City, uh, give up his career there, and move back to his home state of, in his home community of Galena so he could save this, this company. Um, we have another uh, uh, company in the, the city of Alito. The city is an overstatement. In the town of Alito, Illinois. Um, it was the only dry cleaner in the entire community. And there was nobody to take it over. So what happened is the town of, uh, of Alito has no place to take its dry cleaning. So um, this part of the bill, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, is about helping the families in these towns uh, to make sure that as they build their businesses, they have somebody to take the, them over when they move on to other parts of, uh, of their lives or if they pass away. Um, so that's what this is about. I'm really proud that today's funding bill includes provisions for my bill that encourages the Small Business Administration to develop guidance, trainings, and, and an online toolkit to assist small business owners to develop and execute a business succession plan. I'm, I'm really confident that these provisions will help small businesses like the Galena Canning Company, like the dry, cleaning, dry Cleaner in Alito, Illinois, keep their doors open and so they can continue to, continue to serve their communities. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize Congressman Ruppersberger. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to thank Chairman Quigley, Ranking Member Womack, and the subcommittee staff for their hard work uh, that you put into the FSGG bill. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few items important to both to my constituents. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for including my recommendation into the manager's amendment uh, to increase the draft bill funding for the new office of the National Cyber Director, which will lead the national level coordination of U.S. cyber and strategy. We, cybersecurity is a very important issue for our country. Um, you, you see what's happening with Russia uh, on the cyber tax, and that's just taking money. Uh, cyber tax could also be uh, destructive attacks, uh, which has happened. It happened uh, in Saudi Arabia where they took down um, one of their top um, uh, computer systems. The issue of cyber is important for those of us involved, and I'd like to mention uh, Congressman Landsman. Um, we've been working for about 10 or 12 years attempting to get a direct line to the president. And the good news is uh, that we have a Chris English, who is deputy director of uh, the NSA, who is one of the best in his field. He has been Senate confirmed, and he's standing up this cyber. The problem is because of our NSA is as good as Chinese and, and the Russians, but they don't have jurisdiction within the United States. And so they have to refer their issues um, to either the FBI or the Homeland Security. And what's so important is that um, when they have to make a move, Chris can develop the strategies and the resources to move forward in that, that arena. So I, again, uh, I thank you for helping us uh, for the startup, and it's going to make uh, a difference. The second issue I have is the issue which I'm sure a lot of people in this room have had, and that's the delays of mail in the United States Postal Service. Uh, in my district, we have sometimes two to two and a half, three weeks where people have not gotten their mail. Um, when the new di uh, director um, came into office, things changed. And if there's one thing we've always looked forward to as a country since 1774 has been the United States Post Office and how reliable they've been, how they've been involved in the neighborhoods and that type of thing. Well, it's broken right now, at least in, in my areas. And you know, I've attempted to set up a meeting with, with uh, the chairman, Jolie, uh, no response. But we're trying to work to see what we can do 
but now that we've gotten the post offices, uh, at least original people, we've gotten their eyes, but they're taking people from one spot, putting them into another. So we really have to focus on our mail, where we are, and make sure that we can get back to something that's truly American. The final thing, I look forward to working with the committee and uh, administration to make sure our federal, federal employees uh, continue, who continue to provide essential services to the American people receive a meaningful pay raise for their dedicated service to this country. I yield back. Back. Congressman Harris. Then thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I'd uh, like to thank uh, the subcommittee for including uh, level funding at this time. I'll be offering an amendment later to increase the funding for the Opportunity Scholarship Programs. You know, as a reminder, the committee uh, nine, only two percent of the students who uh, take advantage of these uh, of the Opportunity Scholarship Program are white students. Ninety-eight percent are non-white students. Um, and it's an incredible education opportunity that kind of levels the playing field. I mean, if you really want to talk about equity, this is equity. This makes sure that, uh, you know, the children of the President of the United States uh, have this, uh, has the same opportunity as the uh, child whose median family income is 23000 and change in the District of Columbia. Those, those are the families that are taking advantage of the Opportunity Scholarship programs. Uh, so again, I want to thank the subcommittee for uh, level funding and thank the, thank the president and his budget for uh, uh, offering level funding for this fiscal year and uh, give, the to give the committee the opportunity to actually increase that funding a little bit later on in the markup. Thank you. I yield back. Congressman Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, will also stand in support of this uh, funding bill. So I want to thank the chairman, uh, Chairman Quigley. Uh, ranking Member Womack and the staff for putting this uh, bill together. I'd like to highlight a couple things uh, uh, that we worked on together with other members. First of all, I want to thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member of the Committee uh, for the funding for the land ports of entry. Uh, the money's also for the Federal Buildings Fund, but I do want to talk about courthouses in a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank them for the language for the, uh, for the land ports of entry Center of Excellence and the border infrastructure coordinators are so important, especially now that we passed uh, NAFTA 2.0. Uh, I want to thank them for the CDFI, uh, Community Development and for a Financial Institution Fund also to help in the, in the uh, rural areas and the poverty levels. I uh, also want to uh, thank them for the monies for the state trade expansion programs and the volunteer, the IRS Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. I also want to thank uh, the chairman and the um, uh, members of the committee for adding money's uh, GSA so they can work and uh, work with the uh, Office of Immigration Review Court Space. As you know, we have added a lot of immigration judges to address the issues at the border, but we currently have right now more immigration judges than court spaces. So we literally have immigration judges that are just waiting to get a court space available. So I know that the last year we added monies and we actually have established that, um, I think, eight uh, judges in the Laredo area. Uh, I know that my friend Tony Gonzalez needs uh, immigration judges and court spaces in Del Rio because that's another area that we need to. So I certainly want to work with the committee uh, on this court space so we can have immigration judges but also have the court spaces. Now, let me just mention something, members, briefly on the federal district courts. As you know, we have been funding federal courts for many years. There is a, a list that's put together uh, by the um, Administrative Office of U.S. Courts. Now, we know the drill. They set the priorities. They list number one, number two, number three, and so on. I want to point out one in the border area because everybody talks about the border. Uh, McAllen was number three, uh, and then somewhere down the line, it fell to number four, it fell down to number five, and then it's now number six. And again, I think we should fund the, uh, the courthouses, but I do have a problem uh, when the um, Administrative Office of U.S. Courts uh, start changing the priority, especially since we know what's happening along the border. For example, if, and I, I know some of the members have some of the uh, courthouses here, but I'm not going to mention uh, some, but I'll give you some, uh, the caseload. The caseload, felony cases, class A misdemeanors, 
uh, you will see one court handles about 48 uh, uh, cases uh, per year. Uh, another one 160, another one 242, another 361, another one 550, another, another one 1,165. McAllen has the highest one at 2,282 uh, per, per judge there. But somehow we get dropped down. And on top of that, the courthouse that we have in McAllen, and this is not an earmark, but the courthouse in McAllen used to be a bank building, so it's all glass. And I think some of you have been there, it's a glass. And the majority uh, owner is, a, it's foreign owned. So therefore, the judiciary, the U.S. Marshal, the U.S. Attorney, DSS, we're paying three, uh, $3.6 million to a foreign entity uh, to, uh, to house our judges and other places. So all I'm asking is that we have a low transparency when the judges get together, and I'm sure they don't play politics, uh, but when the administrative office of U.S. court, uh, and, and this is why on the next amendment, I want to thank the chairman because he is asking them to set clearly highlights criteria as to how they set those priority determination. All we want to have is priority uh, uh, transparency on that. So I want to thank the chairman. I know we're going to follow up on this and certainly want to work with the working member and the staff on this. So with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I want to say thank you, and uh, Mr. Womack, uh, thank you very much for the good work that you've done on this particular bill. Congressman Trone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to extend my thanks uh, to Chairman Quigley and also Ranking Member Womack, as well as their staff, for their incredibly hard work on this bill. I'm very grateful to see the subcommittee has approved $110 million for the Drug-Free Communities Program, as well as $6 million for the Community-Based Enhancement Grant. These programs are vital in the war against addiction. I know these critical investments will save lives. I was also pleased to see a robust increase in the salaries for our federal workers. While I'm encouraged to see a 2.7% increase not another paltry 1% we had last year. I hope to continue working with Chairman Quigley and the subcommittee to push for a 3.2% increase for our federal workers. I come from the business world, and our most valuable asset in business or the federal government is our workforce. And we need to pay them like the dedicated professionals they are, particularly during COVID. We saw firsthand how important frontline federal workers are to keeping our economy safe and healthy. They've earned the raise. This is a very good bill, and I'm proud to support it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Congresswoman Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Chairman Quigley and Ranking Member Wormack for the bill before us, including all of our hardworking staff. Throughout the pandemic, our small businesses have struggled and gone through extraordinary lengths to just stay afloat. As a member of the FSGG subcommittee, I'm proud that our bill provides the support our small business owners and entrepreneurs need while protecting hardworking families. I'm especially pleased that two of my CFP requests were included in the legislation. First, the Centropolis Accelerator, a joint venture between the City of Southfield, Michigan and Lawrence Technology University, which provides unparalleled, unparalleled expertise to small businesses seeking to develop their products by supporting their designs, engineering, prototype testing and manufacturing needs. Second, Detroit means business. Under the leadership of the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation is the city's one-stop hub to, stop, to help small businesses stabilize, grow, and to thrive. In the city of Detroit, there are more than 61,000 registered businesses in the small business ecosystem and approximately 50,000 of those businesses are owned by people of color. Unfortunately, 
The existing business support ecosystem serves fewer than 3,000 businesses annually. Additionally, to address broadband concerns, this funding measures include $388 million for the FCC to support efforts to expand broadband access, improve the security of our U.S. Uh, telecommunication networks and administer billions in COVID-19 relief programs. Ensuring access to the internet is critical, whether you're a senior citizen, a student, or work in manufacturing or entrepreneur, more opportunities and resources are available when there's connectivity. As a 30-year veteran of the United States Postal Service, I want to thank this subcommittee for including language to maintain six-day delivery, something the 600,000-plus employees at the Postal Service has done even during the toughest periods of this pandemic. Postal workers have been on the front line for more than a year during this pandemic, ensuring our society remain connected through mail and package delivery. To that end, I want to thank the Chair for including funding for the USPS Inspector General. We know that we're going through some very challenging times with our Postal Service, and it's beyond the commitment of these amazing postal workers but investment in the Inspector General will ensure that we have the resources necessary to have transparency and to continue the critical work. I strongly urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back. Congressman Ryan. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Bill. Uh, it includes numerous provisions that invest in the efficiency of our government, creates opportunities for small businesses to grow, and helps middle class families get ahead. So I'd like to thank uh, the Chair and the Ranking Member. Uh, I would like to thank them for including my request to provide just over $300,000 to help launch the Valley Internet of Things Initiative, which is a partnership between the Youngstown Business Incubator and bright energy innovators that will bring partners together to create and implement training and entrepreneurial support programs for, for Mahoning Valley and Ohio manufacturers. This initiative will help to retain and restore jobs in order to revitalize our local economy. Manufacturing and startups must remain competitive on the global stage. To do this, the Valley Internet of Things initiative will utilize the power of electronics in real-time analysis to improve business operations and energy efficiency. The investment will provide key assistance to these local businesses so that they have the opportunity to grow and create jobs. Secondly, I was pleased to see the committee include just over $385 million for taxpayer services within the IRS. Filing season this year was unlike no other. Between multiple economic impact payments, budget cuts, and Transitioning to a remote work environment, the IRS struggled, to say the least, to provide the customer service that Americans deserve. I've seen firsthand how the struggles of the IRS have impacted my constituents. My offices received countless calls, emails, and letters from hardworking Ohioans that were confused and distressed, to say the least, about their delayed tax returns or stimulus payments, literally on the brink. These cases are only a handful of the 25 million delayed tax returns that resulted from an underfunded system. We can do better than this, and we should. This additional funding will help improve customer service and the overall taxpayer experience. Lastly, I would like to recognize that the committee believes that the United States Postal Service plays a critical role in the federal government's efforts to address climate change. As one of the U.S. government's largest fleet operators, the USPS, must move towards clean, zero emissions vehicles. I am grateful the committee included my request to direct the United States Postal Service to prioritize the robust procurement of electric vehicles through their next generation delivery vehicle program, which will allow the United States Postal Service to meet the spirit of President Biden's executive order to electrify the federal government's vehicle fleet. In short and in closing, uh, I think it's important we started this discussion about competition, about China, uh, in domestic investments that we're making. And even in this bill, when you see the investments for the Valley Internet of Things to help our manufacturers be able to compete, when you look at what we're doing for the IRS so we can reclaim more revenues for pe from people who 
uh, don't pay taxes, we could get that revenue back and invest it back into the country, and why wouldn't we use the United States Postal Service as an opportunity to dominate the global economy when it comes to electric vehicles? Prior to the pandemic, China dominated over 50 percent of the electric vehicle market. Every lever we have to pull, uh, we should be pulling on behalf of trying to dominate these new industries, and you're doing it uh, in this committee bill, Mr. Chairman, and you have my thanks, and I yield back the balance of my time. Congressman Espayat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Quigley. I want to commend the committee for putting together a funding bill that emphasizes support of our nation's small business. As a former member of the Small Business Committee, uh, since I first came to Congress, I am glad to see bipartisan support of the SBA charged with supporting and growing our small businesses out of this pandemic. Small business development centers like those at Lehman College in the Bronx and Columbia University in Manhattan were critical, uh, a critical resource to help small businesses work to receive and pass uh, their, their uh, PPPs and other helps. Throughout this past 16 months, community development financial institutions, CDFIs, including minority depository institutions, have been a lifeline for my constituents in New York's 13th Congressional District. I am glad to see increased support for the CDFI and the Small Dollar Fund. In addition, I want to thank Chairman Quickly for supporting uh, the Healthy Food Financing in uh, Finance Initiative administered through the Community Development Financial Institution Program. This is a great program that benefits Northern Manhattan and the Bronx to build grocery stores, mobile markets, food hubs, and other fresh food enterprises in underserved areas that bring healthy and sustainable food options. And this enables existing stores in, in the city of New York, like our bodegas, to renovate and expand so they can stay open and provide healthy food options for communities uh, that live in a food desert. One final note is for the committee's commitment to the drug-free community program. Uh, and be, uh, it gave uh, a significant uh, amount of dollars larger than beyond prior years. During this pandemic, we have seen a rise in substance abuse and should focus on reducing drug, alcohol, and tobacco use. I want to thank the committee and the committee staff for their hard work on this bill. I support the bill, and I yield back. Congresswoman Kaptur. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to congratulate, uh, along with the other members, uh, Chairman Quigley and uh, Ranking Member Womack for their hard work on this really important bill. And I rise partly to follow on what Congressman Ryan was talking about in terms of vehicles, new age vehicles. Uh, though it's not my power to really accomplish this, I would certainly urge the Postal Service to empower, empower its mechanics across the country to design and build their own fleet of new vehicles. Uh, who knows more about what's needed on those vehicles that we see all across America, whether you're in rural areas or urban areas. And uh, I hope that their board has the wisdom to recognize those who, uh, who serve us uh, as a country and use uh, their great knowledge and the best mechanics in the country to design some of these new vehicles and just not outsource everything, but give a prize for the best ideas. We used to reward uh, patents and we cared a lot about invention. Well, you start where you got the most knowledge and we know where that lies. So I just wanted to put a PS on what Congressman Ryan talked about. And then uh, to thank the committee for recognizing the importance of uh, millions and millions of Americans who don't have normal financial services. It's hard to believe, but a quarter of the people of this country, 25% of American households rely on alternative financial services because they don't have regular credit, fair credit in their neighborhoods. And they get hooked into payday loans, uh, refund anticipation loans, rent to own services, pawn shops, auto title loans. I don't know how many of the members in this room have any of those, but you probably don't. But imagine, 25% of America's households do. So we have to think hard about what to do in financial deserts because we all know people do not live by bread alone but by credit. And we hope that that credit is fair. And the foundation for equitable economic opportunity has to be fair credit. And therefore, this bill does um, attempt to make some changes uh, to allow 
some of the organizations in our country, like the National Credit Union Administration, to offer technical assistance to provide fair credit in financial deserts uh, and to provide reliable, not unreliable or exploitative, uh, financial lifelines to distressed communities. In addition, uh, this bill prioritizes our national security uh, by including over half a billion dollars, 500 million, for election assistance commission grants to empower every election jurisdiction down to the precinct level to modernize our aging election system and further protect our sacred democratic process. I enjoy this bill, I appreciate the bill, and I urge support for the bill and yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments on the bill? Let me just make an announcement. We anticipate that there will be another series of votes at, at 5 o'clock. We have a manager's amendment, which we will take up next, and we have an additional 10 amendments. So I am going to uh, really ask members uh, to um, keep, their, as, keep their remarks uh, succinct uh, and uh, so that we can get through the business and hopefully we might conclude before the next series of votes. And uh, I, I would, if, if we could keep your comments uh, not to five but to three minutes, I think it would be helpful in, in our trying to, move, uh, trying to move forward. We obviously want to give everybody a chance to speak, but uh, uh, also I think people would like to try to finish up by the next series of votes. And with that, uh, seeing no other members wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Mr. Quigley to offer a manager's amendment. Madam the, Chairwoman, I have a manager's amendment at the desk. The clerk will read. consent to waive the reading. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Mr. Quigley is recognized. Madam Chairwoman, this amendment makes some changes to the bill and report that have been agreed to by... Aye. There you go. It's too easy. This amendment makes some changes to the bill and report that have been agreed to by both sides. The changes address several concerns that were brought to my attention after subcommittee markup. I'm going to please to address these concerns, including cybersecurity, courthouse construction reporting, sales of counterfeit goods, review of veterans' records uh, to determine if they are eligible for higher honors, data collection for small businesses, report on hunger, uh, and I believe we've uh, captured most of your request in this uh, in these suggestions we appreciate those uh, so I urge I urge adoption of this non-controversial amendment and I leave uh, the time I've allotted uh, back recognizing what the chairwoman has said most important speech arguably in American history the Gettysburg address was under three minutes we can do the same ranking member Womack just recognized uh, we have agreed, he, the gentleman from Illinois is correct, we have agreed on these non-controversial items, recommend passage. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Not I, with that, I recognize Mr. Quigley for one minute to close. I urge your support. The question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Um, and now, uh, are there any further amendments? I recognize a, a Congressman Walmack. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have an amendment at the desk. And uh, with consent of the group, I would uh, consider it as read. Okay. Oh, this is Walmack number one. Sorry. Walmack number one. This is Walmack number one. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find <coughs> my place here as well. Hold on. Oh, I know where it is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with it. The gentleman uh, from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam yes. Chair, uh, and I'll try to be brief. My look, this, my amendment is pretty simple, uh, although it's uh, pretty important, and that is it stops the second tranche of payments that are going to local governments as a result of the American Rescue Plan. And here's why. You have to understand, I'm a former mayor, so I have a unique understanding of local government, financing local government, those kinds of things. 
And what we're talking about here is an extremely large amount of money that local governments didn't ask for, that in many respects don't need, and to this moment in time don't even know how they would effectively spend this kind of money. We're talking about in the second tranche only. I'm not talking about what's going out now that a lot of local governments have already detailed plans on, on how they want to spend it. I'm talking about what will go out next year is the better part of $200 billion. That's in addition to money that these governments have received from transportation sources from HHS and previously approved COVID packages. CDBG money, extraordinary <laughs> CDBG money in response to COVID-19. There have been many streams of revenues flow to these local governments to help them through this period of time. And yet, the money we're talking about in this particular amendment is so large that they couldn't effectively do it in one year, they had to spread it out over two. I was having a conversation with a me one of the members of my local finance committee meeting, county governing committee, that told me this weekend they didn't know how they were going to spend this money and could they spend it on an assortment of different things that don't fit under COVID relief. Now I realize that we'd all like to be able to give our local officials a lot more money to do a lot, a lot of neat things and to be responsible for helping them achieve a lot of these successes in their local governments. But that's not what the job of the federal government is. And this is a windfall of unprecedented proportions. And at some point in time, the American public is going to look at us and ask the question, why are we throwing so much money, so, so many tax dollars at these local governments and other really unnecessary issues when we all know that every single dollar is borrowed money and is simply going to mortgage, further mortgage the future of generations to follow us, likely in the form of higher taxes. We're going to have to pay this money back. So I plead with my fellow appropriators, can we not be the adult in the room for once? Can we not show the American public that we can constrain ourselves from unnecessary spending, remember, that they didn't ask for and in a lot of cases don't need? Madam Chair, it's been reported that California has in excess of a $75 billion budget surplus. Wisconsin, $4.4 billion surplus. Even Arkansas, small state of Arkansas, surplus is about a billion dollars with all revenue streams above expectation in the month of May. We're on the tail end of COVID. It would be irresponsible of this group to continue to shovel money out the door because of COVID-19. Again, the American taxpayers are looking at us, the appropriators, and asking the question, when is common sense going to prevail when we know that this money is going to flow out the door, it's going to have to be repaid, and there's not even a real need demonstrated for it. So what I would like to see us do is the smart thing, claw it back from the second tranche and save future generations from excess spending that doesn't have to happen. And that begins with us. And I think it begins today. With that, I'll yield back my time. Is there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment, recognizing Congressman Quigley? I respectfully rise in opposition to the amendment offered by the ranking member uh, this amendment would block billions in funding for eligible state and local governments. Uh, this is vital funding that supports ongoing efforts to continue to decrease spread of the virus 
and then the pandemic. It ain't over yet. There are serious risks involved. It also goes to help replace lost revenue for state and local governments to provide vital public service and help retain jobs. The funding also supports economic stabilization for households and businesses. You know them in your districts. For them, it ain't over yet. I would ask my colleagues, do we have a list of the impacted states and local government that would be denied funding, and how much, and what their shortfalls are, and what their needs are, what this has done to their long-term and short-term debt? Has this amendment been scored by CBO, and do we know the full impact on the FSGG bill? For all those reasons, I again respectfully ask my colleagues to vote no on the amendment. Are there any other members who wish to speak on the amendment? Not let me recognize myself for a, a minute. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Ranking Member Womack. I'd like to just remind the gentleman that under this amendment, the state of Arkansas loses $786 million. That goes to supporting working families, small businesses, to pay teachers, and to pay our police and fire uh, departments. The amendment would block billions in funding for eligible state and local governments, critically needed for COVID-19 recovery. Of, in my state of Connecticut, that totals more than $4.3 billion. The funding uh, is vital. It supports ongoing efforts to continue uh, to beat the spread of the virus, to end the pandemic, and particularly as the variants begin to spread. It, re it replaces lost revenue for state and local governments to provide vital public services and help to retain jobs, frontline health workers, um, and I might add it is police departments and fire departments, uh, and it would in fact uh, provide less funds uh, in dealing with police and fire. Um, the funding also helps families and businesses, so state and local governments do not need to raise taxes in order to stay afloat. Um, and I uh, yield back to myself. Okay. Are there any other members? If there is no further debate, the gentleman from Arkansas is, is uh, recognized for, to close for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. And look, I, I respect, I respect your, your comments there about the impact that COVID has had on state and local governments. I, I, I get that. I, but again, as I said in my uh, initial remarks, we have put lots of money in the coffers of, of state and local governments as a result of all of the things you just mentioned. And even though we're not completely out of it yet, Remember, we've got a tranche going out right now that is, in, in some cases, this may surprise you, but there are some places in the country where the money that they're about to receive is equal to or greater than their annual budget. This is an astronomical amount of money that's flowing to these cities and counties. They didn't ask for it. They don't know how they're going to spend it. I'm sure they will on something. And the vast majority of these dollars are going to be spent on things that are in no way related to the coronavirus. And it's money that's coming out of the pockets of our kids and our grandkids. And somebody needs to play the adult in the room and say enough is enough. And I think we start with a second tranche of these monies. And I yield back my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And the amendment is not adopted. Roll call vote. Thank you. A, roll call, a recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade, yes. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark? No. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Cole? Mr. Christ? No. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar? No. 
Mr. Cuellar, no. Ms. Deloro? No. Ms. Deloro, no. Mr. Diaz-Balart? Mr. Diaz-Balart, aye. Mr. Espayat? No. Mr. Espayat, no. Mr. Fleischman? Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Yes. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel? No. Ms. Frankel, no. Mr. Garcia? Aye. Mr. Garcia, aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Ms. Granger? <coughs> Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Harder? Mr. Harder, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris. Oh, I, Mr. Dr. Harris, hi. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson, aye. Mr. <coughs> Joyce. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California, no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. <coughs> Lee of Nevada, no. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng, no. Mr. Molinar. Yes. Mr. Molinar, Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. <coughs> Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan? No. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley, no. Mr. Rushenthaler? Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard? Ms. Roybal Allard, no. Mr. Ruppersberger? No. Mr. Ruppersberger, no. Mr. Rutherford? Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Simpson? Aye. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart? Aye. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres? Yes. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Trone? <coughs> no. Mr. Trone, no. Ms. Underwood? No. Ms. Underwood, no. Mr. Valadeo? Mr. Valadeo, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman? No. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Ms. Wexton? Yes. Ms. Wexton, no. Mr. Womack? Aye. Mr. Womack, aye. Does any, member, does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Ms. Herr Butler, no. Just one more time. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford? Yes. Mr. Rutherford, aye. Who else holds? With that, the clerk will tally. Yep. On this vote, the yeas are 23, the nays are 34, uh, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Ma'am, I have an amendment at the desk. Okay. We'll make number two. Okay. For, uh, the clerk will read the amendment. We'll make number two in the bill on page 
111, line 91, after the dollar amount. Without a jump. Without a, uh, I'm sorry. I seek unanimous consent to consider it as read. It's your job to say without The gentleman a from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll get this right eventually. Uh, it's my first one. Um, by the way, those of you that didn't get a jam or a jelly, we still have them over here, and, and I want you to help yourself. And if you've got a bagel like Cartwright did earlier, go ahead and open it up and, and enjoy it. I hope it was good. Um, look, this particular amendment strikes $6 million from the U.S. Postal Service and strikes report language directing the establishment of postal non-banking financial services modernization pilot program. As everyone knows, the Postal Service is in a financial crisis. The Postmaster General testified before the committee that they're projected to lose $160 billion over the next 10 years. While diversifying revenue is a hot phrase in the financial world, it's not the avenue Congress should force USPS to take in their mission to become solvent. The Postal Service needs to focus on its core mission of delivering reliable, affordable, and universal physical mail, not expand into areas where it lacks expertise. The Postal Service has a hard time keeping up with day-to-day -day deliveries. A recent study found that one in five pieces of mail is arriving late. Once again, this doesn't seem like the time we should force them to divert resources to new missions. The idea of expanding postal banking is nothing new. The report even references a 2015 OIG report suggesting the expansion of banking services could relieve some of the Postal Service's strain. Six years later, the recently released Postal Service 10-year plan for reaching financial stability does not include, let me say again, does not include expanded banking services. If we want to reduce the number of unbanked or underbanked Americans, we should invest in programs we've already talked about today, like CDFIs, the National Credit Union Administration's Community Development Revolving Loan Fund, the bill we're debating today already provides substantial increases for these programs. So let's not force the Postal Service into a new mission against its will. I urge adoption of the amendment, and I yield back my time. Are there, Mr. Quigley is recognized. I respectfully rise in opposition to the amendment offered by the ranking member. This amendment would eliminate the modest funding included in this bill for pilot programs to explore potential updates and the modernization of the Postal Service financial products, such as money orders. More than 10 million Americans currently use these products. Many are people who have limited access to traditional banking systems, particularly minorities, senior citizens, and military service members and their families. In fact, bank branches are closing at record <clears throat> rates, leaving many residents without any good options for banking services. The guy from Chicago is talking about the fact that this is a impacting rural areas so dramatically. Where do they go for basic banking services? Well, most of them have a local postal service. For all these people, postal financial products provide an essential lifeline for engaging in everyday financial services that we often take for granted. It helps them avoid alternative lenders that are often operating at predatory rates. Predatory rates. This funding would simply provide the post office the opportunity to examine ways to increase the efficiency, reliability, security, and safety of these products, just as it is done with mail and package services. This would help millions of the most vulnerable Americans save money and time while reducing the risk of financial fraud and improving overall postal customer service. For these reasons, I must respectfully oppose the gentleman's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same, and I yield back. Are there any other members who would like to be heard on this amendment? Now that I recognize myself, I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Mr. Womack. Uh, this amendment would eliminate funding to establish financial inclusion opportunities. What are those opportunities? It's a limited set of financial products, money orders, wire transfers, check cashing, ATMs. Um, uh, these are for our underbanked constituents. They total more than 63 million people. 
in 2017. People living in both rural and urban communities, the underbanked are those that have limited access to the traditional banking system. It includes communities of color, senior citizens, military service members and their families. The Postal Service is well placed to help underbanked communities have access to these services by partnering with credit unions and community banks. The funding would allow the post office to examine ways to increase efficiency, reliability, security, and the safety of these products. This would help millions of the most vulnerable Americans save money and time. And I would note if we had a postal banking uh, uh, in place, it would be an incredible source for families who are newly eligible for the child tax credit to set up accounts for direct deposit. For these reasons, I oppose the gentleman's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Madam Chair. Recognize uh, Congresswoman Kaptur. Yes, I just wanted to put a couple of statistics on the record as I rise in opposition <coughs> to the gentleman's uh, amendment. Uh, if you look across the country, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation found that 63 million adults are considered underbanked with over 90% of zip codes lacking a bank or credit union in rural areas. Think about that. That's the majority of zip codes in rural areas. And close to 46% of Latinx and 49% of African American households are underbanked. I mean, that causes you to swallow, right? Without proper banking services, these communities are forced to use payday lenders uh, and other rapacious exploiters uh, that charge 20 times more for interest than normal financial services do. The programs being talked about here are non-bank financial services, as the chairwoman said. And um, uh, I don't think it hurts to try to help people conduct their ordinary lives uh, during the pandemic. What a situation we faced in post offices across this country as people tried to get medicine and so forth. So uh, they already have experience in money orders and so forth. And I really, I, perhaps the gentleman doesn't understand what's trying to be done here. I think he does want to provide fair credit to everyone. And for these areas of our country that are completely without services, the post office is the one reliable institution that exists in every single place in this country. I support um, uh, the efforts in the bill to try to enhance what is already being done, and I regretfully oppose the gentleman's amendment and ask for its defeat. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? There is no further debate. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. Now, thank you, Madam Chair, and I won't take a minute. I, I just want to remind you that the 10-year banking plan of the current postmaster does not include these banking services. And as I said earlier, we have already plussed up by enormous amounts some of the institutions that deal with the very unbanked folks that uh, my friends are talking about here. So rather than throw another mission at the U.S. Postal Service, which all, always struggles to do its core mission, and I think we ought to save them from this uh, particular area and, uh, and, and urge, urge adoption of my amendment, and uh, we'll yield back the balance of my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no, no. In the opinion of the chair, then the noes have it. The amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Congressman Calvert. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. For what per uh, for the I court? ask unanimous consent that the okay. amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman uh, is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Uh, Chair DeLauro, uh, Ranking Member Granger, Chairman Quigley, and Ranking Member Womack, I appreciate the opportunity to offer my amendment, which would require an emergency declaration by the President before relocating federal employees from unrelated agencies to assist with the situation at the southern border. While the Biden administration refuses to call the record number of individuals illegal, illegally flooding across our southern border what it is, a humanitarian crisis, I am concerned by the Department of Health and Human Services solicitation for an untold number of federal government civilian employees to assist at facilities for unaccompanied children along the border. The administration actions and rhetoric are inconsistent. Either this is an emergency that commands the full resources of the federal government, 
or we should not be compromising the important missions of various agencies by diverting civilian employees to care for unaccompanied migrant children. The Department of Agriculture, for example, maintains that their day-to-day -day operations will not be impacted by 500 employees taking a 120-day leave of absence to assist at the border. If these employees are essential to the mission of the department, how can this be true? That is, maybe we ought to look at the personnel levels at the Department of Agriculture. I'm also concerned that volunteers from agencies such as the Department of Defense or Agriculture lack the qualifications and safety training to care for unaccompanied children at the border. How are these individuals being vetted? Do they have a background in child care? Are they proficient Spanish speakers? What kind of training will they receive before supervising these children? Between January and about the end of this month, over 800,000 individuals were apprehended at our southern border. 434 percent increase from 2020. It's obvious why the Biden administration needs additional personnel, but the president needs to call this crisis what it is an issue, an emergency declaration to ensure appropriate resources and adequately trained professional staff that are ready to assist. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Members wishing to be heard, Congressman Quigley is recognized. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Mr. Calvert. This amendment would prevent any funding in this or any other bill from being used to temporarily assign federal employees to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, or OR, to supervise or provide services to unaccompanied migrant minors unless the President declares a disaster. I would like to point out that the number of kids in HHS custody has declined by 8,000 since March. The reason temporary intake sites are needed is because the COVID pandemic has reduced the availability of beds in HHS's network of state licensed facilities. In the meantime, OR is expediting the placement of children with safe and suitable sponsors. In fact, one of the activities that federal employees are doing on their assignments to OR is assisting with case management services so that children can be placed with sponsors as quickly as possible. This assistance from federal employees has been uh, important in reducing the number of children in custody. So I would respectfully urge a no vote on this amendment. Recognizing Chair Granger. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support the gentleman from California's amendment. It was a mistake for President Biden to withdraw President Trump's emergency declaration and stop border wall construction in the middle of what is clearly a crisis at the border. Last month alone, more than 180,000 migrants were apprehended. While the crisis on the border rages on, the administration has proposed to reduce funding for the Department of Homeland Security while detailing employees from other agencies who lack the experience to address the situation. This will only put a Band-Aid on a problem that the administration has the power to fix, and it removes federal employees from the critical jobs they are being paid to perform. I support this amendment, and I urge a yes back. I yield back. Congresswoman Lucille Roy Ballard. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I oppose uh, this amendment. I understand that the gentleman from California is offering this amendment due to the belief that the border is in a disaster and in a crisis mode as a result of po uh, policy choices made by the Biden administration. Frankly, this is a false argument. Prior to this administration, the United States had abrogated its responsibilities with the several inhumane policies it implemented such as the Remain in Mexico policy that needlessly put thousands of lives in danger. The fact is that the United States can and should support opportunities for legitimate asylum seekers to seek refuge in our country, and that process requires humane treatment and due process of adults, families, and children. Unaccompanied children are among the most vulnerable of our population 
who cannot and should have never been subjected to Title 42 expulsions. We cannot afford to let politics get in the way of our responsibilities to provide these children the care they need and deserve. I am grateful to the hundreds of federal employees who heard the call for public service and answered it. The voluntary workforce, as used by the Biden administration, was an effective way to move children out of dangerously overcrowded CBP facilities, and these volunteers were instrumental in placing children with sponsors, which created additional space in ORR shelters, improving child safety. This amendment doesn't provide additional protection to children. We should be celebrating this positive reflection of American values, not condemning it. And I urge opposition of the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Oh. No, no. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm obligated as the chair of the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Subcommittee and as a mother to speak out against this amendment. Earlier this year, President Biden asked civil servants to volunteer for 120-day details with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. That's the agency that takes care of unaccompanied minors. These dedicated public servants were called on to sign up to help ORR take care of the influx of children at the southern border. Now my colleague on the other side of the aisle wants to exploit the, kind, exploit the kindness and the dedication of these public servants, I, I, I guess presumably to score political points. His amendment would block these civil servants from helping migrant children unless President Biden declares an official national emergency like our previous president erroneously did. That is unconscionable. The phony national emergency called by the previous president was a fraud. It was a political sideshow. And in declaring that national emergency, the previous president granted himself the, the, the despotic authority to raid funds that we appropriated for military projects designed to shelter our service members and maintain their military readiness, to the tune of $7.2 billion. In addition to stealing from our armed forces, the previous president threw kids into cages to deal with this supposed national emergency. Now, thankfully, we're going to be able to recoup much of that funding. And we now no longer have a phony national emergency declared that is putting our military readiness and taking care of our service members and their quality of life at risk. Um, but that is hopefully not the model that my colleague wants President Biden to emulate. I say using children as political pawns and putting the readiness and the quality of life of our, the members of our military at risk should be beyond the pale for any of us. And I urge my colleagues to vote against this callous amendment. I yield back. Congressman Womack. Yeah, well, look, I, I, I'm in support of my friend Ken Calvert's uh, amendment. Uh, just to, to kind of cut through all the political speak here, you know, who's, whose fault it was, you know, the failed policies, all those kinds of The fact that we're even talking about a situation like I personally witnessed on the border when I was down there weeks ago, and hopefully most of you have been there. Um, that would constitute a crisis in anyone's definition. By anyone's definition, that's a crisis. To stand there on our southern border and watch people, masses of people coming across the Rio Grande River and finding refuge in this country, and then the fact that we're talking about taking federal employees who were hired to do a critical job for the federal government and instead they're becoming caretakers and babysitters for the people that are crossing our border, that ought to, ought to concern everybody, regardless of your political stripes. So I support the gentleman's amendment. If, if there's not a national emergency, we should not be detailing federal employees to do something other than their hired mission. So I urge adoption of the amendment. You'll back my time. <coughs> Representative Diaz Ballard. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, 
this, this is just not an issue that should be that complicated. Okay. And by the way, right. trying to say that what is happening in the southern border is humane is frankly having no understanding of what's going on to the people at the southern border right now. When you look at the increase of the numbers of little girls who are being sexually assaulted, that is not humane. There is nothing humane that has taken place in the southern border when it's totally controlled now by the cartels. And so uh, you have now an administration that is begging people from other agencies to go down there. And all that this amendment says is let's just, let's, let's just recognize the reality. This is inhumane. It is hurting our national security interests. It is putting people at risk. We are seeing the, 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 the increase of narcotics coming in through the border because, as the gentleman from Arkansas just mentioned, folks are now having to be diverted to do other jobs that they're not scheduled to do or trained to do. All this amendment says is there's a crisis in the southern border. Let's recognize it so that we can proceed accordingly. And I think not recognizing that is, frankly, hard to understand. I yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. Gonzalez. I rise in uh, support of my colleague from California. You know, my district is over 40% of the southern border. And while I appreciate all the volunteers from across the country, especially in our federal government, that have gone to the border to help with this crisis, uh, we absolutely need to designate it as a national emergency. And we need to replace those volunteers with actual experts in their field, because volunteers aren't gonna solve this problem. One party isn't gonna solve this problem. It's gonna be both of us that come together to solve this crisis, because it goes beyond words. Every day I'm on the border, every day I see unaccompanied children by the thousands that are left on a loan, regardless of their legal status. They're innocent children, and we can't have volunteers taking care of these children. We have to have professionals. In El Paso, there's 1,600 unaccompanied children at Fort Bliss. 120 of those have been there for greater than two months. This is a national crisis that deserves the attention if we're gonna solve this beyond just pushing a political football around. And with that, I yield back. I, I yield to myself here. Let me just make some, some points. I rise in strong opposition to the amendment offered by Mr. Calvert. Let me just say the number of kids in HHS custody has declined by 8,000 since March. The reason we need temporary emergency intake sites is because the COVID pandemic has reduced the availability of beds in HHS's network of state licensed facilities, state licensed facilities. There are currently about 15,000 unaccompanied children in HHS custody. If we were able to use 100% of the existing network of state licensed shelters, plus the facility at Carrizo Springs, the influx facility, there would be enough beds for all of the children in HHS custody. In the meantime, we are expected, and by law, we are expediting the placement of children with safe and suitable sponsors. And one of the activities that the federal staff are doing on their details to ORR is assisting with case management services so that the children can be placed with sponsors as quickly as possible. This assistance been, has been critical in reducing the number of children in custody. One of the, we do not have the additional beds because of the COVID pandemic. Otherwise, we could accommodate the children coming across. You want to talk about inhumane? Let's go back to separating children at the border. I've been to the border many, 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 many times. I've spoken to the children. I've talked to their families. Let us not forget what happened in a prior administration. And it was due to a prior administration that the current administration was forced to take action to address the number of growing children that the U.S. took into our care. Yes, kids in cages, 
And when asked at the then current secretary of HHS, do you have a system for placing the children and reuniting them with their family? I was told, yes, there are children today who have not been reunited with their families. That's a disgrace, what the current administration is trying to do. And if we, those beds free up, if COVID is, 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 is if we turn the corner, then the system is taken care of. No humanity was exercised in the past. We are indeed looking at humanity today and recognizing that these are children that we are by law obliged to take care of. So let's do what we are supposed to do and make sure that they have the standards and the quality of life that they deserve while they're in our charge. I recognize Congressman Espiat. Thank you. Madam Chair, I rise in opposition uh, to this amendment. Uh, during the Reagan administration, uh, there were millions of undocumented folks in the country and people crossing the border. And what that president did was enact amnesty during the George W. Bush administration, there was hundreds of thousands and millions of undocumented in the country. And what that president did was fight for immigration reform. In the past administration, there's been millions of folks that are undocumented in the country that cut our grass, fix our backed up kitchen sink, take care of our children and our frail elderly parents, and instead of doing what those two previous, previous presidents did, they dropped the ball. They created chaos. They had a hiring freeze. The conditions at the border were inhumane. I saw it myself, stingy, dirty cells with people packed like sardines. And now we're doing cleanup work. And the new administration has taken the initiative to take care of that humanitarian crisis. Yes, we have. And we need people to do that. That's correct. We need federal employers to do that. Because since there is no political will, Madam Chair, to do what Ronald Reagan did, or what George W. Bush did, then yes, we must take care of ourselves. And I, I stand in strong opposition of this amendment, and we must all do better. I yield back. Are there any other members who wish to be heard? Madam Chairwoman, I uh, stand up in, in strong support of the gentleman from California's amendment, and frankly, in extreme opposition to some of the statements and assertions that are being made in this room today. Uh, I was at Fort Bliss just a few weeks ago, and I can tell you those conditions down there for, our, for those children coming across the border unaccompanied right now are not humane. At the time I was there, there were about 5,500 kids between the age of 20 or 12 and 17, many of them there for several months. This is not what any parent would want for their child. Those conditions were not humane. The current policy under this administration is akin to placing an ice cream truck in a minefield. We are literally right now incentivizing kids to cross the border illegally into this country. I'm the son of an immigrant. My father was born in the desert south of that border. I understand the value proposition of coming to the United States, but I do understand the value proposition of doing it legally. And we as a nation right now are failing our neighbors to the south by incentivizing them to come here. They are not safe, they are not suitable, Madam Chairwoman. There's plenty of beds down there, yes, but there's not plenty of due diligence. There's not plenty of criminal background checks into where we are sending these kids and to whom we're placing these kids and to which homes they're going to. While I was there, I saw an NIH scientist who quote unquote volunteered for the mere salary of $250,000 a year plus per diem to go down there and facilitate making phone calls. This was an NIH scientist doing this. I think words matter. I think when we say that we're funding volunteers, 
Where I come from, volunteers don't do things for money. They do things out of the kindness of their heart. And we are literally spending tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars a year right now as a result of these misguided policies. I yield back, Madam Chair. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? If there's no further debate, the, the gentleman uh, is recognized for one minute to close on the amendment. In uh, closing, I just might uh, remind everybody that the volunteers are paid. They're per are paid federal uh, employees, and they do receive uh, per diem. Uh, let's just be honest about the situation at the border. It's a, it's a crisis. I've been there. Most of us have been there. Uh, it's overwhelming the Border Patrol, law enforcement, health and human services staff. Uh, that's why they need these federal employees. Let's call it an emergency. That's all this amendment does. It doesn't do anything other than that, other than say, calling it for what it is. So uh, I would recommend that uh, we vote in favor of this amendment and let's deal with this problem. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In, well, in the opinion of the chair, the no's have it and the amendment is not adopted. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being a supporter, recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Amade. Oh, Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade votes yes. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. No. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. No. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. No. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Aye. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Yes. Mr. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Aye. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Kaptur. No. Ms. Kaptur votes no. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Yes. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. No. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. No. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. No. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. No. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Aye. Mr. Womack votes aye. 
Uh, yeah. Mr. Oh. Does any, uh, does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Adderholt? Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Are there additional members who wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 24, the nays are 33, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments to the bill? Sure. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, and I ask it be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman. Uh, is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, my amendment would prohibit the SEC from using any funds provided by this bill to propose, adopt, or enforce a rule requiring small bu businesses to publicly disclose new information that is not material to investors. My amendment supports the longstanding definition of materiality, which was developed by the Supreme Court. Material information is that which a reasonable investor can consider important making an investment decision. The definition of, uh, this definition of materiality is a critical pillar to our public company disclosure system, in the, which has contributed to making our capital markets the best in the world. Recent comments by leadership at the SEC and some of my friends on the other side of the aisle make me concerned that the SEC could become an agency focused on pushing a political, social uh, agenda instead of an agency that requires proper disclosure of information that is useful to investors. I do understand that in some cases, ESG information on climate change could directly impact the performance of a public company. Fortunately, current security laws already mandate that if a chain faces a material risk because of climate change, it must disclose that risk. Creating categories of information that are de facto material is not part of the SEC's mandate. The SEC should not require the disclosure of information on demographics, climate, or corporate governance, which is not useful to investors. Not only would that lead to the mandatory, not only would the mandatory disclosure of this unnecessary information lead to confusing information overload for investors, it would also deter small businesses from going public, leading to fewer opportunities for investors. My amendment specifically prohibits the SEC from implementing new non-material disclosure requirements on small businesses. By excluding small businesses from future burdensome requirements, my amendment protects those businesses which are now looking to grow through a public offering don't have the resources to hire teams of CPAs and lawyers which would be needed to maintain compliance with new ESG rules. My amendment supports small business which, unlike large corporations, do not have huge compliance departments. The result would be fewer opportunities for investors looking to save for retirement, buy a home, or put their, put their kids through school. As we rely on growing businesses to contribute to our economic recovery, through participation in public markets, I hope my colleagues will join me in protecting investors and small businesses from the burden of unnecessary new requirements. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Chair recognizes Congressman Quigley. I respectfully oppose the amendment offered by Mr. Joyce. This amendment would block the SEC's effort to modernize public company disclosures and provide investors with the information they need to make educated decisions with their hard-earned money. To minimize regulatory burdens, newly public companies, known as emergency, emerging growth companies, already have streamlined disclosures. However, this amendment would preclude the SEC from requiring such companies to disclose information on political campaign contributions, financial risk from climate change, or corporate board diversity. This is not frivolous information. Investors are asking for and need this information 
to understand how companies operate and what they stand for. In fact, this amendment may do exactly the opposite of what the sponsor intends. If companies aren't required to disclose such information, it could harm investor confidence and lead to less investment when these companies most need it. For these reasons, I again respectfully oppose the gentleman's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Womack is recognized. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, just uh, to stand in uh, support of my friend's amendment. Uh, look, it helps protect small businesses from attempts by the majority and the Biden administration to collect unnecessary disclosures. It forces small businesses to report to the SEC on items not material to the business. And all it's going to do is it's going to be costly, which I think we would all agree we don't want to impose greater cost on our small businesses and will discourage many of them from ever going public. It limits their ability to raise capital, limits investment opportunities for Main Street investors. This amendment protects small business. We should all be in favor of this, and I yield back. Are there other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? If not, I, Mr. Rutherford. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we're not there yet. <laughs> so, no further debate. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is important to note that my amendment does not exempt company from SEC rules or guidance. It simply protects small businesses from new obligations to disclose information that is not helpful to investors. Again, my amendment upholds the standard of materiality, which for decades has guided how we decide what information investors should have. Requiring businesses to disclose non-material information increases their cost for the disclosure of information that is, by definition, not useful to investors. I urge adoption of this common sense amendment, which prevents the SEC from setting social policy while supporting strong capital markets, investors, and small businesses. I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Ohio. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And the I'm amendment sure is not adopted. Recorded vote? Okay. Yes, please. Recorded yeah. vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, please raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Yes. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. No. Mr. Amade votes no. Mr. Bishop. Oh, I, yeah, you mean I. Mr. I, Mr. Amade votes aye. <laughs> Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. No. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Aye. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. No. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Ms. Granger. Yes. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Mrs. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California, no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng? No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar? Yes. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse? Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo? Aye. 
Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree? Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan? No. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard? Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger? No. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford? Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan? No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson? Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart? Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres? Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone? Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood? Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo? Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman? Mrs. Watson. Mrs. Watson Coleman? No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton? Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack? Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote, Mr. Rush? You're not recorded. Mr. Mr. Rushenthaler votes aye. Mr. Cuellar, you're not recorded? Mr. Cuellar votes no. Mr. Let's Mr. Gonzalez. One at a time. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Okay. The clerk will the clerk will tally. Yeah. Oh, Ms. Lawrence, you're not recorded. How are you recorded? How do you want to be recorded? No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Is there anyone else here? Okay. okay. Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 25, the nays are 33. The amendment is not adopted. Madam Chair, can I have a recount? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to see if there are any hanging chads here, Mr. Joyce. <laughs> we'll bring in the guys from Arizona. Mr. Stewart is recognized. Fur further amendments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, Stewart number one, and ask that it be considered read. Okay, the gentleman, for, uh, uh, without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. On the Thank you, Madam Chair. The in the interest of others being able to hear, I'm going to reclaim my seat. The purpose of this amendment is to protect children. The purpose of the amendment is to hold government vendors responsible when they don't protect children. All this amendment does is prohibit funding on contractors for cloud computer services for the U.S. government that do not have safeguards against child pornography. 
Services should not host or transmit images which depict apparent violations of child exploitation laws and follow the law in reporting these violations to law enforcement, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I understand we can't force all web host providers to search their servers for this material, but we can require that providers of these services who want to sell to the U.S. government, that they do ensure that they are not knowingly hosting or transmitting material and then to report those violations. Now think about this for a minute. When laws were written years ago to address the spread of child pornography online, it wasn't possible then for what is possible now. And that is there are programs that can continuously and accurately identify, report on, and delete these images. And yet today it's entirely possible it should be, it, it should be encouraged I'll conclude by saying I've worked with the Department of Justice and Secret Service and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on this issue. We can stop the spread of these images. It's a reasonable expectation for our government contractors. And I honestly can't imagine anyone opposing this effort. Child pornography destroys innocent lives. And I ask for the support of this amendment. Mr. Quigley is recognized. I share Ms. Stewart's concern for the safety and well-being of all children. This is a nonpartisan issue. We all want to keep children free from exploitation, harm, and danger. For these reasons, uh, you know, we are going to support the amendment, accept it. We we'll want to make sure as we work and we move forward together, working together, together there are no unintended consequences. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The amendment is accepted and adopted. Are there any? Congressman Womack? Don't let me get in the way. <laughs> okay. Are there further amendments? Thank you, Madam Chair. And if you don't mind, I have a I further proceed. amendment at the desk, Stuart yeah. number two, and I ask that it be considered read. No, no, it's no, it's been accepted. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. Still need I to apologize. Vote. I apologize, my ear. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted, so thank you. Thank you very much. The adoption amendment is so rare, we didn't know how to respond. Madam right. It's, ain't it the truth, Mr. Stewart? So go for it. You're on next. Well, since we're on a roll, I would ask that uh, Stewart number two, uh, which is at the desk, be considered read as well. So ordered. You're recognized for, five, for three minutes. Thank you. And I can be very brief again in the interest of time. This amendment is very simple. And I believe it's a minimum that we can do. This amendment prevents the administration from loosening sanctions on the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran, as I think almost everyone and perhaps everyone in this room can agree, is a thuggish regime. It brutalizes its own citizens. It is the number one sponsor of terrorism worldwide. They've been seeking a nuclear weapon, and even the International Atomic Agency has recognized that they are enriching material beyond what they agreed to in the JCPOA. Many of us believe that the JCPOA was fundamentally flawed, and the previous administration was right to withdraw and begin confronting the Islamic Republic of Iran's malign activities. And this one thing is clear. Maximum pressure campaign was working. The Iranian regime's ability to finance its malign activities has been significantly reduced. Their GDP has declined by between 5 and 8 percent. Inflation is very high. It's severely damaged the value of their currency. Oil production has been down by 50 percent and exports down by 75 percent. The point of that being, and the reason for that, is that U.S. sanctions have forced Iran regime to reduce its funding for terrorist proxy groups. The State Department has acknowledged the benefits of sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration, but now they want to waive them in the hopes of returning to another Iran Iranian deal. The world is a dangerous place. Again, everyone in this room recognizes that. But keeping these sanctions in place will force Iran to end its malign activity. It helps to protect America's interest, and I urge support for this amendment. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Recognize uh, Chair quickly. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Mr. Stewart. Uh, now, I share the gentleman's deep concerns with the numerous wide-ranging threats posed by Iran. But this amendment supports a policy pursued by the last administration that tried to impose maximum pressure on Iran and had the United States unilaterally withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. 
isolating us from our allies, and wait for Iran to agree to more stringent nuclear commitments and stop its malign activities in the region. Let's remember, when we were part of that deal, Iran was in compliance. When we withdrew, they weren't anymore. That policy failed, not just on that basis, but any other way of analyzing the situation dealing with Iran. Yet this amendment would have, have us double down on that approach while stripping the administration of the flexibility needed to responsibly negotiate a return to a nuclear agreement in exchange, in exchange for strict compliance by Iran. I remember I was part of putting sanctions on Iran, driving them to the table to get a deal so that they would be in compliance. That worked. Maximum pressure and isolation did not. This amendment is both irresponsible and short-sighted. Iran's nuclear program is progressing as we speak. This will amendment will only further escalate tensions between the U.S. and Iran and make a diplomatic resolution much more difficult to achieve. The negotiations underway are critically important to our own national security interests and those of our allies. Rather than adding obstacles, we should be supporting the administration's goal of returning and ensuring Iran does not acquire nuclear weapons, whether we like it or not. We often have to work with our adversaries, and by building on our agreements, we can begin to address other aspects of Iran's, nef Iran's nefarious activities. This amendment would prevent that important work and ultimately make America and our allies less safe. I would urge a no vote. Chair recognizes the ranking member of the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support the gentleman from Utah's amendment because I'm concerned about the administration's approach to Iran. Iran has expanded its nuclear program and is working to develop ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear weapons. In addition, Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, sowing chaos all over the region, including in Syria and Yemen, and supporting Hezbollah and Hamas. The rocket attacks on Israel last month are just the most recent example of Iran's using its proxy forces to spread terror. We must be firm in our commitment to stopping Iran's nuclear ambitions and terrorist activities. It sends the absolute wrong signal to weaken sanctions at such a volatile time in the Middle East. I urge, I beg a yes vote. Congressman Womack is recognized. Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in uh, strong opposition to this amendment. I regard it as a kind of poison pill amendment designed to undermine the Biden administration as it undertakes negotiations with uh, our European allies, Russia, China, and Iran, on preventing Iran from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon. Now, regardless of how you voted on the JCPOA in 2015, we know that the implementation of this international agreement applied the most stringent verification and monitoring regime ever placed on a country, resulting from nuclear-related negotiations. We also know that the previous administration's policies, namely blowing up the agreement and applying what they called maximum pressure, were an abject failure. They did not work in bringing about a so-called better deal. On the contrary, they have brought Iran once again close to a nuclear breakout capacity. So it's critical that the Biden administration take the diplomatic steps necessary to return both Iran and the U.S. to JCPOA compliance in order to prevent Iran from attaining a nuclear weapon, in order to achieve urgent non-proliferation objectives more widely, and to lay the foundation for further work on important issues. So I urge my colleagues to support U.S. national and international security by rejecting this amendment. I yield back. Mr. Womack. To be very brief, uh, I support the gentleman's amendment, and I associate myself with the remarks of our ranking member, Ms. Granger, in what uh, she had to say. Uh, I cannot, in, in the strongest of terms, uh, support that uh, that thinking any more so than, than with, with an urging of a yes vote on this uh, amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Congresswoman Lee. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I rise to oppose this amendment. Uh, the, J the 2015 JCPOA, or the Iran deal, was a landmark agreement that effectively put Iran's nuclear program in check and made it subject to international inspections. The JCPOA was built on painstaking diplomacy to build consensus among a broad coalition of nations that Iran's nuclear program should be subject to restrictions. That effort was deeply damaged by President Trump's harmful abandonment of the deal, a deal that was working. But the damage also deeply undermined American credibility around the world. Withdrawing from the JCPOA sent a message to the world that the United States couldn't be trusted to uphold its end of a deal. Right now, the Biden administration is working overtime to try to clean up this mess. This amendment seeks to block the administration from negotiating, to block them from rebuilding our credibility with allies and adversaries alike. We need to let our diplomats negotiate in good faith. The JCPOA is a crucial tool to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. We need to revive it. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? There's no further debate. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for one minute to close on his amendment. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, the chair, chairman called this um, amendment irresponsible and short-sighted, and I just dis disagree with that. I think it's very responsible, and we're trying to take the long view. I believe the chairman is serious about containing Iran, as I am as well. <laughs> The chairman would like to pursue another agreement. I, on the other hand, feel like maximum pressure is the best way forward. The thing is, is they're not mutually exclusive. If you want to pursue another agreement with Iran, continuing the maximum pressure is the most effective way to bring them to the table and to force them to negotiate sincerely. Relieving the pressure, relieving the sanctions, makes it far less likely that they will do that. It makes the goal that many of you have expressed of having a new JCPOA-like agreement with Iran much less likely. If you want to have an agreement with Iran, keep the sanctions on. That's what this amendment does. And with that, I again urge adoption of the amendment, and I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair. Oh, recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support of recorded vote is ordered. The clerk, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade, aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright? No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case? Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark? No. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Cole? Mr. Christ? No. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar? Ms. DeLauro? No. Ms. DeLauro, no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart, aye. Mr. Espayat? No. Mr. Espayat, no. Mr. Fleischman? Aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Yeah. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel? Aye. Ms. Frankel, no. Mr. Garcia? Aye. Mr. Garcia, aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Harder? Mr. Harder? Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler. Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mrs. Hinson. Aye. Mrs. Hinson, aye. Mr. Joyce. Aye. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee of California? No. Ms. Lee of California, no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada? No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada, no. Ms. McCollum? No. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Meng? No. 
Ms. Meng, no. Mr. Molinar? Aye. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse? Aye. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo? Aye. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree? Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan? Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley, no. Mr. Reschenthaler? Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard? No. Ms. Roybal Allard, no. Mr. Ruppersberger? No. Mr. Ruppersberger, no. Mr. Rutherford? Mr. Rutherford, aye. Mr. Ryan? No. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Simpson? Aye. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart? Aye. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Trone? No. Mr. Trone, no. Ms. Underwood? No. Ms. Underwood, no. Mr. Valadeo? Aye. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman? No. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Ms. Wexton? Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton, no. Mr. Womack. Aye. Mr. Womack, aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Not recorded. You're not recorded. Okay. Mr. Quayer, Mr. Quayer, no. Mr. Harder? No. Mr. Harder, no. No. The clerk will tally. Any additional members who want to change their vote or record their vote? Look that way. On this vote, the yeas are 25, the nays are 33, uh, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further? Uh, are there any further amendments? Madam Chair, Ms. Hinson is 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 recognized. For what purpose does the general uh, woman rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Hinson number one. Hinson number one. At the end of Title VI, add the following. Oh, and I'd, I'd ask unanimous yeah. consent to dispose of the reading. Okay. Uh, the gentlewoman is recognized uh, for three minutes on the amendment. Uh, uh, just a, a, a point. I understand that votes are now at 5.30. That, that means if we are uh, I will be judicious brief. here, we can, we can move forward and wind up before we take votes. Yes. Ms. Hinson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment is simple. It uh, simply prohibits taxpayer funds from being used to pay for elective abortions for federal employees. Iowans and American taxpayers shouldn't be forced to pay for elective abortions, and specifically to force them to pay for bureaucrats' abortions is beyond too far. And yet that's what the underlying bill does by not including the writer. So I know nobody in this room wants to misuse our judicious taxpayer dollars, and that's not why we're all here. Uh, we are here to carefully exercise the power of the purse. And for decades, that meant including the Smith Amendment, ensuring that our taxpayer dollars did not go toward elective abortions, including those for federal employees on the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. The Smith Amendment has prohibited elective abortion funding for federal employees since 1983, the year I was born, 38 years ago. The ban includes uh, exceptions for instances of rape, incest, or life of the mother. Now, I want to be clear here, there is no reason for a federal bureaucrat's health plan to include it on the backs of hardworking Americans. Taxpayers pay the salaries of federal employees and about 75% of their benefit premiums. So that means taxpayers are supporting approximately 8 million bureaucrats' health benefits right now. The majority of those taxpayers do not want their hard-earned paychecks and tax dollars funding bureaucrats' elective abortions. In 1980, before the Smith Amendment was enacted, FEHB plans, paid for by the taxpayers, funded about 17,000 abortions per year for federal employees. That cost about $9 million at the time. 
Obviously, we've come a long way since then, time-wise, so let me say that again, without this amendment, taxpayers pay for about 17,000 bureaucrats' abortions each year at a cost of at least $9 million, and that's not even accounting for the inflation since 1980, or how massively our federal government has grown. As we heard today, uh, plans to add about 50,000 new federal employees, so you can imagine the cost there. Uh, this is simple. It's in the interest of taxpayers to support this amendment. So I ask you in joining me in reinstating this basic taxpayer protection, voting yes on Hinson Amendment Number 1. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The Chair of the Subcommittee, Mr. Quigley, is recognized. I rise in opposition. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Ms. Henson. This amendment would destroy, would restore language that limits the ability of federal employees and their dependents to access abortion services. This is an unnecessary restriction that bans federal employees from accessing legal and constitutionally protected medical services. We shouldn't deny anyone coverage just because of how they're insured. It's simply not fair to Congress to mandate that hardworking civil servants should get different health coverage from their neighbors. This is a complex, personal health decision made by women and their families after consultation with their doctors. It is not something that elected officials should be deciding. For these reasons, I must oppose Ms. Henson's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same, and I yield back. Chair recognizes the uh, uh, ranking member of the full committee, Congresswoman Granger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support the gentleladies from Iowa's amendment. This language has been included in appropriations bills and supported by Republicans and Democrats for decades. The government pays about three-quarters of the federal employees' health insurance premiums. I don't believe that taxpayer funds should be used to fund abortions for employees receiving these benefits. Reversing this long-standing language could mean we will not be able to reach a bipartisan agreement on this bill, and it will not become law. I support the amendment and urge a yes vote, and I yield back. Congresswoman Frankel is recognized. That, thank you, Madam Chair. My, 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 here we go again. I rise, I guess I'm sitting this one so I can be close to the microphone. I'm in opposition to this amendment that would prohibit use of funds for abortions under the federal employee health benefit. Here's the thing, because some lawmakers are consistently unsuccessful in their attempts to make abortion illegal, they try to make it impossible for women to obtain it. Specifically, among other tactics, they use abortion coverage bans to put the procedure financially out of reach as for as many women as possible. Many of these bans prohibit insurance coverage of abortion services in government-run health programs. Now, let me just say this. Uh, our, as we see today, federal employees are a prime target of this type coverage ban because some legislators happen to have control over their private health insurance. Here's some important background. The FEHB program provides health insurance to civilian federal employees. The program is a network of private insurance plan that covers more than 8 million federal employees or dependents and retirees. And for more than 30 years, some lawmakers have used appropriation bills uh, to deny this uh, a coverage for abortion. And this amendment tries to deal a really deadly blow to a very good bill. So, what do we have to say about our federal employees who commit their lives to public service? Uh, should we penalize them because of the source of their health insurance? These workers contribute their own private dollars to pay their premium costs, as do most American workers who receive health insurance through their employees. Government workers deserve the same benefits and access to comprehensive health care as those in the private sector enjoy. And keep in mind that lifting the ban would not mandate that all FEHB plans offer abortion coverage. It simply would allow participating plans to choose whether or not to cover, just as they do in the private marketplace. Leaving women without coverage for safe, common, and sometimes critical health care denies them the comprehensive coverage they need and exposes them to unanticipated additional costs. 
It is plain common sense to understand that women seek abortion care for many reasons, and we cannot possibly know the circumstances of every woman making medical decisions about her pregnancy. Every pregnancy is different. By limiting coverage options for federal employees, we limit a woman's ability to make decisions that are best for them, their families, and their circumstances. I think we can all agree that living a safe, healthy life is a basic right, and everyone should have control and care for their own bodies. And this includes women who work for the federal government. And let me be loud and clear. Women cannot truly be equal if we don't have control of our own bodies and reproductive lives, including making one of the most important decisions, which is whether, when, or how to become a parent. And this means that every woman should be able to make decisions about pregnancy, including the decision to have an abortion. And the ability to that, make that decision should not be blocked by banning rightly earned health coverage by hardworking people. This amendment is no good. Vote it down. Well, I couldn't be uh more different on the subject than uh, the gentlelady who just spoke. I rise in support of the amendment. I personally don't believe that taxpayer funds should ought to be used for abortions. And because the federal government pays about 90 or 75 percent of the employee health insurance premiums, I think it gives us a voice in this matter. Uh, the federal taxpayer, who has strong opinions on this issue, should not be forced to pay for abortion services for government employees, plain and simple. And the fact that this language has been supported by Republicans and Democrats for decades, let me say it again, the fact that this language has been supported by Republicans and Democrats for decades, I believe should give it merit, and I would encourage you to adopt the amendment, vote in favor of this amendment, and, uh, and I yield back my time. Congresswoman Lee. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. I uh, rise uh, in opposition to this amendment. Uh, now, let me, let me just say this. This amendment, and you've heard earlier what it would do, federal, prohibit federal employees to have equal coverage to reproductive health services solely because of the health insurance that they have. Now, all federal employees should have equal access to the health care that their counterparts in the private sector receive. Again, as co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus, I know that this is going to come up many, many times over the course of our markups. But let me be clear. No one should be denied the constitutional right, their constitutional right, mind you, to an abortion because of how they are insured. Everyone should be able to make these personal decisions about their lives based on what is be best for them and not be denied coverage because of how they are insured. Our federal employees should be provided access to the full range of reproductive health choices, including abortion care. Elected officials should stop interfering in women's personal decisions about their own bodies. No one needs a voice in this matter other than the woman and whomever she wants to talk with and to consult with and to help her make these very difficult decisions. I urge a no vote on this amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I thank the gentlelady from Iowa for offering this amendment. I uh, thank the gentleman from Arkansas and wanna, want to uh, echo what he says. This is not about access to abortion. This is about just who pays for it. The fact of the matter is the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan is 75 percent subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer. And, an, and a majority of U.S. taxpayers think that tax dollars shouldn't be used to pay for abortion. Now, the average federal employee earns $109,000 a year. The average federal employee has a much better plan in general, health plan, than the average employee in the private sector. And Planned Parenthood advertises abortions for $390. I've had six children. Let me tell you, it costs a whole lot more than $390 to raise a child. And we don't have federal insurance to raise a child. So why should federal insurance pay to abort a child? It would make more sense if we had insurance to help us raise children, right? 
Gentleman. This is about who pays for it, Madam Chair. That's all. And again, I thank the gentlelady from Iowa for offering the amendment. Congresswoman Clark. Did you call on me? Congresswoman Madam Clark. Madam Chairwoman? Yes. I, I, I do not have comments on this amendment. Thank okay. you. Congresswoman Underwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly oppose this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Now, we're going to see a lot of harmful amendments like these in the coming weeks and months. As the only nurse on this committee, I want to say right now at the start, I am committed to beating back every single one. This amendment would continue to block federal government employees from choosing employer-sponsored health insurance that covers abortion care. And that's unacceptable. Your boss should not be able to tell you how to use your health care coverage. And nobody should be denied reproductive health care because of how they're insured. Health care is a critical benefit that employees weigh heavily when choosing who to work for. Most employees of private companies don't face these restrictions on reproductive care. But federal employees have for decades. This makes the federal government a less competitive employer, undermining America's ability to compete globally and threatening our national security. It's long past time to repeal Hyde in every form and ensure that women are finally free to choose whatever health care options work best for them. That's what our country just sent Democrats to the Senate, the House, and the White House to do. This amendment would take us backwards, not move us forwards, and I urge my colleagues to oppose it, and I yield back. Congresswoman Lawrence. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I strongly oppose this amendment. And again, as I stated every single time that this is brought up, where is the debate about men getting Viagra? Where is the debate about whether a man can choose a vasectomy? But to, uh, you can sit on your platforms and say, I have the right as a government to tell a woman what she has the right to do with her body. I will stand up against this as a federal employee. I was once a federal employee. You know what? I went to work and I took an oath just like every member of this Congress to serve and protect this country. We fight for the rights of our veterans. Our federal employees are on the front line taking care of this country. And I expect, as a woman, to have the freedoms and rights now, if you want to bring up whether we can give men Viagra, bring it on. Let's have that debate. If you want to talk about when you can get a SNP and end the, your right to have children, let's bring that debate. But I will not tolerate having this kind of restrictions placed on women. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I yield to myself. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered by Ms. Hinson. Once again, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are trying to restrict access to abortion to individuals who are covered by the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, federal employees and their dependents and spouses. Many states, including my own, include abortion coverage in their health insurance benefits, and Congress leaves them alone. This amendment denies critical, uh, uh, critical ab ab abortion coverage to federal employees in the District of Columbia, Connecticut, and across the country. Let me be clear. If you're a federal employee living in the state of Connecticut, this amendment would restore language that bans federal employees and their dependents for coverage, uh, which is legal and constitutionally protected. Yet, your next-door neighbor who works for the state of Connecticut or buys their insurance on our exchange, Access Health Connecticut, or is covered by Husky, our Medicaid program, has abortion coverage that includes access to abortion care. It's not our place. It's not our place to decide for someone else whether they should get an abortion. That's a deeply personal decision they must make with their family and in consultation with medical professionals. I oppose this amendment because we should not interfere with someone's personal health decisions by withholding health insurance coverage. Are there other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? If there is no further debate, the gentlewoman from Iowa is recognized for one minute to close on her amendment. Yeah. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do appreciate the comments shared by my colleagues today. But um, at the end of the day, again, this is about who pays for these services, and it's the taxpayers. Uh, at the end of the day, 60% of taxpayers in this country do not want their hard-earned tax dollars going to pay for elective abortions. Uh, let me be clear, we should not be forcing Americans to pay for these elective abortions for bureaucrats, not today and not ever, and we've had bipartisan cooperation on this in the past. So I would hope that we have that again today. But I do want to close by saying elective abortions are not health care. And with that, I implore you all to support my amendment, stand up for taxpayers' rights, and most importantly, stand up for the voiceless. Madam Chair, I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from uh, Iowa. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the no's have it. And the Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is, is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. No. Mr. Amade, aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. Yes. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark. No. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro, no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart, aye. Mr. Espayat. No. Mr. Espayat, no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Yes. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel. Yeah. Ms. Frankel, no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder, no. Dr. Harris. Aye. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mrs. Hinson. Aye. Mrs. Hinson, aye. Mr. No, Joyce. There are three more. Aye. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California, no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada, no. Ms. McCullum. No. Ms. McCullum, no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng, no. Mr. Molinar. Aye. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan. No. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley, no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. No. Mr. Roybal Allard, no. Mr. Ruppersberger. No. Mr. Ruppersberger, no. Mr. Rutherford. Aye. Mr. Rutherford, aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart. Aye. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone, no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton, no. Mr. Womack. Aye. Mr. Womack, aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Quayer, aye. I don't think there's any more. The clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 26, the nays are 32. 
and the amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Ms. Hinson? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk, Amendment Hinson, Amendment Number 2, and I would also seek unanimous consent to dispose of the reading. Okay, without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentlewoman from Iowa is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, much like my previous amendment here today, this amendment is a straightforward defense of taxpayer dollars. My amendment tonight would reinstate the historic Dornan Amendment, also known as the D.C. Hyde Amendment, uh, preventing appropriated funds from being used to pay for abortions in the District of Columbia. It includes preventing either federal or D.C. revenues from paying for abortion, except in the case of rape, incest, or life of the mother. Now, taxpayers overwhelmingly, as we've already discussed today, support pro-life protections on their hard-earned tax dollars. Again, that recent poll that found about 60% of Americans uh, would like these protections to stay in place. And unfortunately, without this amendment, taxpayers would be forced to pay for hundreds of abortions. And that's exactly what happened the last time D.C. Hyde was gutted. From 2009 to when it was reinstated in 2011, D.C. paid for 300 abortions. And at that time, there was at least a prohibition in place on federal funds. Not anymore. And by the way, in Washington, D.C., it is legal to perform an abortion for any reason, even late term. So if this amendment fails and all restrictions on taxpayer funding of D.C. abortions are lifted, the Charlotte Logier Institute estimates that approximately 1,400 to 1,500 abortions will be funded in D.C. every year. I believe we must stand up for American taxpayers who oppose this kind of horrific spending. And I also believe, most importantly, we must be standing up for America's most vulnerable, the voiceless babies and the women who are harmed by this. Our constituents don't want their money to pay for abortions in Washington, D.C., or anywhere for that matter. This is a carve-out that goes well beyond fiscal, fiscal irresponsibility, and it's just plain wrong. I ask for support for the amendment. Madam Chair, I yield back. Yeah. Mr. Quigley is recognized. I rise in opposition to the amendment. In this instance, the amendment would block the use of local funds and federal funds for abortion services. The reality is by banning public funds for abortion services, we are in effect banning access to those legal and constitutionally protected services. Choice is the heart of this issue, but it's not a choice for us to make. It's a choice for women and their families, a choice between women and their doctors. Yeah. The duly elected local officials of the District of Columbia oppose this amendment, and if they want to support this prohibition on local funds, they could pass it. They have not. If members of Congress want to run the District of Columbia and restrict the ability of residents to engage in certain activities, they should pick up petitions and run for office in D.C. The Constitution grants Congress oversight over the district Therefore, we are choosing to offer district residents the right of self-determination supported by democratic ideals of self-governance. The people that live here in the district full-time should have the final say in what services are funded, not members who fly in every other week. For these reasons, we must oppose the gentlewoman's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Womack is recognized. I'll be brief. I rise in support of the amendment. Appreciate the gentlelady for bringing it forward. I don't believe that taxpayer funds should be used for abortions, whether it's anywhere else or whether it's in the District of Columbia. Um, and it's been said before, uh, if this kind of language, which has been here before, is removed from the bill and remains out of the bill, uh, the pro if the prohibition is not included, it does indeed imperil our ability to pass a very important appropriations bill. And uh, so I would support the amendment, urge a yes vote, yield back my time. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? Congresswoman Clark. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I oppose Ms. Henson's amendment, but I do agree with her that this amendment is straightforward. This amendment is a straightforward attempt to insert Congress in between a woman and her doctor. It is a straightforward attempt to impose the will of outsiders onto the 700,000 citizens who live in the District of Columbia. And it will have a straightforward disproportionate impact on women of color. As we have discussed many times in this committee, limitations on the use of public funds to provide necessary and medically appropriate reproductive health care is inherently discriminatory. 
In this specific case, the amendment would prevent the District of Columbia from using its own funds to provide abortion coverage through Medicaid, a restriction that no state is subjected to. No one in this room was elected to represent the people of DC, so who are we to overrule the will of their representatives and say they cannot use their own money to provide reproductive equity? This amendment will not only interfere with the right of people of DC to use their tax dollars how we see fit, how they see fit, it is an attempt to prevent the women of DC from accessing the health care they need. We should be removing these types of barriers, not doubling down on them. I urge my colleagues to oppose this misguided amendment, and I yield back. Congressman Adderholt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I just want to quickly also urge support for this amendment, uh, which, of course, the intention of reinstating the D.C. Hyde Amendment, uh, and I do appreciate the efforts of our new colleague uh, on the committee to introduce this language. Uh, I know that a lot of our colleagues uh, will say that this amendment is about attacking women's health care, but uh, I see this as uh, that abortion is not health care. Uh, our nation should invest in women's health. We should not be investing in abortion. So, Madam Chair, I would urge support for this amendment, and I yield back. Congresswoman Lee is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise to oppose this amendment. and. First of all, I'll just say it sounds like you all um, who are supporting this amendment believe that um, the District of Columbia is a colony, but it's not. Black and brown women, low-income women in, the, in Washington, D.C. should be able to make their own decisions about their own personal decisions as it relates to their health care, including abortion care. And this is about how the District of Columbia decides to use its resources, not about your resources, not about mine. It's the District of Columbia's. Uh, and I don't know if you all would want some of us to come into your districts and tell them how to use their money and how they should uh, prioritize their resources. And uh, for you to want these women in Washington, D.C. to have to be subjected to your own personal views is just totally outrageous. So I would hope you'd respect the women of the District of Columbia who this uh, ban would affect, and they're mainly women who look like me. And uh, it's very arrogant of you to even suggest that you would have the control over black and brown women's lives, low-income women's lives in this district, when in fact the district decides how and what they want to do with their money. So I ask for a no vote on this, and I hope that you'll begin to respect the women of the District of Columbia and respect the government of the District of Columbia to make their own decisions and decide how they want to use their money and stay out of the district's business. Thank you, and I yield back. Congresswoman Frankel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, my, 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 here we go again. And I, uh, I'm in opposition to this amendment that would seek to undo our progress to remove the ban on Medicaid funding for abortion care for residents of Washington, D.C. While all 50 states may use their state funds to cover abortion services, this amendment would override the will of D.C.'s own elected officials and people. And I, I want to emphasize, uh, there is not nor has there ever been anything bipartisan about denying access to abortion? Okay. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to the most important decisions in life, such as whether to become a parent, each of us must be able to consider all our options, however little we earn or however we are insured. And that includes the people who live in Washington, D.C. It's not our place to decide for someone else whether they should get an abortion. It's better that they make that decision with their family and their faith because we don't always know someone's circumstances. We're not in their shoes. And the fact is that the harm of abortion coverage bans falls hardest on the people of color working to make and meet. Ensuring that all people have access to the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion care, 
is an essential part of addressing racial injustice and other inequities in our health care system and building a more and just equitable society. It's time to take the knees off the uteruses of the women of this country and the world, I may add. And I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Women aren't truly free unless we can control our own bodies, our lives, and our futures. So let's all be committed to a future where we can all have the freedom to control our own bodies and safely care for our families and live with dignity so our communities can thrive. I urge my colleagues to vote no. This is a bad amendment. I yield back. Recognize Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would rise in support of the gentlelady from Ohio's amendment. And I have to say, I, I will always rise to support life. Madam Chair, it, it, it's beyond me. Whether that life is in D.C. or that life is in Florida, where I represent, uh, I represent life everywhere. I fight for life everywhere. And I'll fight for it every time. The taxpayers, it's very clear, do not want their tax dollars used to take a life in the womb. And Madam Chair, many of us understand that whether you take a life in the womb or you take a life at First and Main Street, that's just geography. And so I, I, I rise in support of this amendment and encourage all of my colleagues. Thank you. Ms. Underwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly oppose this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. This amendment goes even further than Hyde. It would ban the District of Columbia from using its own locally raised funds for the full range of abortion care. States can pay for abortion care if they want to, but this amendment seeks to deny D.C. and the hundreds of thousands of women who live here that same self-determination. And you know, it's hard not to connect this to DC's fight for representation and to our fight to pass HR1 and HR4. Because DC residents are Americans too, but they are still subject to these restrictions that people in any other state don't face. And when we talk about those restrictions, we can't ignore the fact that 45% of district residents are black. The majority of DC residents are people of color. Whether it's the right to vote or the right to abortion care, people of color bear the burdens of these restrictions most heavily. I refuse to be a part of that, and I urge my colleagues to do the same and oppose this amendment. I yield back. Ms. Torres, recognized. Madam Chair, I am uh, very much. Uh, is it? No? Ms. Torres. And then Ms. Lawrence. That's what I thought I heard. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for recognizing me. I stand in opposition. This amendment is cruel. Lawmakers should not be in the business of taking away critical health care services from D.C. women, period, just because they can and just because they live here in Washington, D.C., I am pro-life too. I, that is the reason why I support childcare as an issue. That's why I support food stamp programs. That's why I support assistance for people that have lost their jobs, no fault of their own. It's amazing how my colleagues on the other side of the aisle can oppose time and time and time again these humanitarian assistant programs for women to be able to raise their children and feed them and be able to work. And yet, they want to dictate how our bodies should function. And they want to deny, deny health care. These women are not your property. I stand in strong opposition of this amendment and urge all of my colleagues to vote no and vote yes 
on the real programs that will help advance women and their choice to be successful and productive adults. Ms. Lawrence is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very much uh, in support of the lives and the process that women's body are blessed to go through to give birth. But I'm very much opposed to this legislation. Um, we have an issue with maternal mortality in this country where women die from childbirth at a rate higher than any other country of a, of that has a democracy or a country that has resources. We are faced constantly with challenges and the, the insult to say that a woman's right to make a reproduction choice about her life is not health care. That is insulting and it's not health care if you live in Washington, D.C. or if you're a federal employee. I oppose this bill and I still say that a woman should have the same rights that any man in this country where we never bring up the discussion of your choice for your reproductive health. And we who carry the brunt of the risk die from birth and all the other challenges that comes with having children. Shame on you. I, I oppose this bill. Are there other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? Dr. Harris. Thank you, Madam Chair. The mortality rate for the baby during an abortion is 100%. I yield back. Are there other members who would be worse to hurt Mr. Cartwright? Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the question in my mind is, who are these people? Who are these people that we would uh, deny them the right to vote for president? Who are these people that we would deny them a, a representative in Congress with a real vote? Who are these people that we, we would deny them a, a full say in their local government and how they would run it? And who are these people that we would deny them the right to make their own reproductive decisions? Who is it that lives in D.C.? For crying out loud, they're the staffers that make this very committee work. We couldn't do our work without them. They're the people who feed us when we're in town and care for us. They are the people who protect us, the Capitol Police, you know, that protect us from the furry hats and horns crowd. Remember that? Why would we cut down on these people's rights across the board? I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? If there's no further debate, the gentlewoman from Iowa is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. The majority of amendments, uh, the majority of Americans do not agree with the statement that elective abortion is health care. And the majority of Americans do not agree that they should be forced to pay for residents of DC to have abortions. Such a concept is uh, out of touch, and I like to talk about this all the time, that kitchen table conversations in Iowa aren't necessarily reflected here in Washington, D.C., and I think this is exactly um, demonstrative of that. Um, if anyone in this room believes that a family in Waterloo, Iowa, who is trying to put food on the table, uh, is thinking about funding abortions here in D.C., I think they're sorely mistaken. Um, we should be sp supporting small businesses with those dollars instead of uh, supporting elective abortion procedures. And um, if, you, if you think that's the right way, then I'd say vote your conscience. I'm certainly planning to vote my conscience today. I'm standing up for taxpayers, and most importantly, I'm standing up for the unborn here today. And with that, I encourage you to vote for my amendment. Um, Madam Chair, I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from uh, Iowa. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion, no. Of, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. I seek a uh, roll call vote, Madam Chair. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. Not here. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. No. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright? No. 
Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case? Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark? No. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Christ? No. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar? No. Mr. Cuellar, no. Ms. DeLauro? No. Ms. DeLauro, no. Mr. Diaz-Bellart? Mr. Diaz-Bellart, aye. Mr. Espayat? No. Mr. Espayat, no. Mr. Fleischman? Aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? No. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel? No. Ms. Frankel, no. Mr. Garcia? Aye. Mr. Garcia, aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Harder? No. Mr. Harder, no. Dr. Harris? Aye. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler? Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mrs. Hinson? Aye. Mrs. Hinson, aye. Mr. Joyce? Aye. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Kaptur? No. Ms. Kaptur, no. Mr. Kilmer? No. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick? No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence? No. Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee of California? Ms. Lee of California, no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada? No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada, no. Ms. McCollum? No. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Meng? No. Ms. Meng, no. Mr. Molinar? Aye. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse? Aye. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo? Aye. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree? Yeah. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan? No. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley, no. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Rogers, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard? No. Ms. Roybal Allard, no. Mr. Ruppersberger? No. Mr. Ruppersberger, no. Mr. Rutherford? Aye. Mr. Rutherford, aye. Mr. Ryan? No. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Simpson? Aye. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart? Aye. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Trone? No. Mr. Trone, no. Ms. Underwood? No. Ms. Underwood, no. Mr. Valadeo? Mr. Valadeo, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Ms. Watson Coleman, no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton, no. Mr. Womack. Aye. Mr. Womack, aye. Oh. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? You're not recorded, Congressman. Okay. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Okay. The clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 25, the nays are 33, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Let me uh, uh, update on votes uh, about 545. We have two amendments to go. I leave it to your best judgment to rock and roll. Okay, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Harris is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I have an amendment to the desk and ask the unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Uh -huh. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an issue that's before the committee uh, frequently. Again, I want to thank the subcommittee for, uh, for putting in the, uh, this is about the uh, Opportunity Scholarship Program and that part of the bill that deals with federal payment for school improvement in the District of Columbia. Uh, and my amendment would increase the funding to the authorized level of $60 million. And, uh, and, and of course, that 60 million is evenly distributed between, because of the way it's structured would be between the Opportunity Scholarship Program, public schools, and public charter schools. Uh, and it would also remove the requirement that these schools uh, comply with, uh, any, any school receiving this assistance would comply, have to comply with IDEA or with, uh, with uh, uh, applicable civil rights legislation. Because first of all, uh, uh, private schools in the, in the city don't uh, get I separate IDEA funding, so it would be unfair to ask them to 
to comply with it and not fund, not, not provide funds for it. And a student who has the disabilities could, all, could always go to a public charter school if they don't want to use the traditional public school system. With regards to the civil rights protections, the fact of the matter is that the Philadelphia ruling by the Supreme Court, I think, would, make, would render invalid any attempt to enforce it anyway. Uh, so, that, uh, so I think th those two provisions uh, should be removed, and my amendment would remove them. Uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's interesting, if you look at page 56 and 57 of you know, the little booklet in front of you, on 57 it describes the school program, and it has the $52.5 million with no, with no increase from last year and no change from the President's budget. But on the page before, it's the federal payment for the District of Columbia Public Defender Service. And interestingly enough, there was $11 million we could add to that fund. Madam Chair, I would offer, I would offer that investing in education is probably a much better deal than investing in the public defender's office. Because I think that's how you avoid having to, having to invest in it. The fact of the matter is that if we want to talk about equity for minority students in the District of Columbia, 60% of, of the white residents of Columbia, white students, go to private schools. Less than 20% of minority students go to, public, go, to, go to private schools. And that's because they simply can't afford it. The median income for people with an OSB scholarship, median family income is $23,000. These are students who will never achieve educational equity without this program. So I would, offer, I would move that we would uh, increase the funding, and uh, that's what my amendment would accomplish. I yield back. Mr. Quigley is recognized. I rise in opposition. Uh, the amendment strikes the language in a bill that requires schools accepting voucher students to certify they are providing students with the same civil rights and special needs protections under federal law. <coughs> students who attend private schools with vouchers are stripped of these constitutional and statutory rights provided to students in public schools. Despite receiving public funds, private schools participating in the D.C. voucher program are not required to abide by all federal civil rights laws and public accountability standards that public schools must meet. Schools that do not provide students with these basic civil rights and disability protections should not be funded with taxpayer dollars. And we certainly should not be increasing funding for this program. While it's true that the SOAR Act has non-discrimination non provisions, they aren't enough. The language in our bill helps supplement that gap. Federal government taxpayer supported assistance to public schools comes with strings for a reason. It's the law of the land for a reason. It's for the protection of our most vulnerable children. Children attending D.C. voucher schools receiving federal funding should receive the same protections. For these reasons, we should oppose this amendment. Mr. Womack is recognized. I, I support the gentleman's amendment and can't say it any better than Andy did. He, he did a great job articulating the reasons. Uh, but striking burdensome restrictions that force most schools participating in the program uh, potentially to withdraw, limit school choice for low-income uh, students in the District of Columbia. It would have a devastating impact on uh, their educational outcomes. Uh, so the Opportunity Scholarship Program is a record of success for low-income students. Ninety-seven percent of twelfth grade participants in the program graduating, and over ninety percent of them being accepted in two- and four-year colleges. I agree. If, if, we, if we want to chart a course for the, for the low-income students, then I think Investing in these programs is a better way forward. And so uh, with that, I recommend a strong yes vote on the amendment yield back my time. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? Congresswoman McCollum. Thank you, Madam Chair. We just had an intense discussion about taxpayers' dollars and how they would be used or not used um, in health care. I don't want one dime of mine to go towards fencing out a student with an emotional, physical, or intellectual disability. Not now, not ever, not one child, not one parent fenced out. I uh, oppose the gentleman's amendment. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? If there's no further debate, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for one minute to close on the amendment. Thank you very much. Well, if you, if you don't want to support the funding for the, for the OSP schools, then my amendment actually increases funding to those other schools that actually, that actually have to uh, take students with disabilities because they receive uh, f federal funding directly. Remember, the, uh, under Section 3008E of the SOAR Act, scholarships are not considered assistance to the schools. They're considered assistance 
to the students. They're not assistance to the schools, they're assistance to the students. So I, I would, again, I would uh, move the amendment. I think that, uh, you know, 2% of opportunity scholarship, opportunity scholarship program recipients are white. 60% of white students attend a private school. You want equity? You gotta uh, provide the, these uh, families with an income of $23,000, the ability to send their children to the same schools that we have the ability to send our children to. I yield back, Madam Chair. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? If there's no further debate, I said that already. So the questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments to be offered? Congressman Garcia. Madam Chair, I've got an amendment at the desk uh, request to be considered read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, at the end of 2020, the Federal Register uh, totaled an astounding 87,251 pages of regulations. These are pages filled with countless burdensome, costly, and duplicative regulations that kill jobs, raise prices, depress wages, reduce economic opportunity, and in many cases, slow growth. My amendment would effectively require agencies to identify two regulations to appeal for every rule that they want to issue. Let me repeat that. If we induce a new regulation, this amendment would require the agency heads to repeal to an exchange. In a time when small businesses are working to claw their way back to profitability after a year of government-mandated shutdowns and Americans are looking, get, looking to get back to work, now is the time to bring, to bring real regulatory reform to the American economy and our citizens. From 2017 to 2020, when we were in an era of deregulation, the unemployment rate reached a generational low. The economy gained nearly 5 million jobs. The real median household income in 2019 rose nearly 50 percent for those uh, more than the uh, previous eight years under the Obama presidency. And compared to the Obama uh, presidency's second term, wage gr growth actually grew 24 percent faster for Hispanics. 79% faster for African Americans and 95% faster for Asian Americans. Much of this was a result of cutting bureaucratic red tape and it's a proven way to spur economic growth and encourage Americans to get off the sidelines and get back to work. This amendment would uh, simply put regulators on a budget and slow the explosion of federal regulations that hamstring small business and cripple our economy. I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Quigley. I rise in opposition. Uh, this amendment prevents the administration from crafting critical regulations that help improve the lives of the American people. The word random comes to mind, uh, requiring federal agencies to arbitrarily jettison regulations before they can proceed with their important work is not the way to govern. Our regulations and guidance have important functions. When we don't like something, we call it a bureaucracy. When it saves lives because it deals with highway safety, air safety, food safety, worker safety, the water we drink, the air we breathe, you know, those are okay. There's a way to address regulations you don't like, that you think are duplicitous, that you think are contradictory. Uh, there's a way to address that. We have that process. But simply to say, if we pass one, if we regulate one, we've got to take away two, is just mind-bogglingly poor government and uh, should be not, it should not be supported, and we oppose the amendment. Mr. Womack. Rise in support of the amendment. Um, I, I, I do not disagree with the fact that agencies should be expected to continually eliminate outdated and or burdensome regulations, especially before promulgating new ones. So I support the gentleman's amendment, uh, urge adoption, yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Very quickly, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Calvert. I just point out that large corporations, large businesses love regulatory environments because it puts their small business competition out of business. With that, I yield back. If there is no further debate, the uh, gentleman is recognized uh, on, on the amendment for one minute to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, it would be an amazing coincidence if these uh, 87,000 pages of regulation that, that probably uh, contain hundreds of thousands of rules were absolutely necessary in today's day and age. Many of them are stale, many of them are decades old. Uh, there's nothing random or arbitrary about this uh, amendment. Uh, if we trust the agents to create new regulations, uh, we can also trust those agencies and their leads to remove the ones that are obsolete and latent. Uh, that's not a stretch of the imagination. This is what businesses in the real world do in order to stay competitive, and we as a nation, uh, I'm sure, can figure out a way to do that as well. I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Let me just, uh, are there any further amendments come before the committee? No. If not, then I will um, ask the, recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support on this bill. Yes, Madam Chair, um, I move to favorably report the Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Act 2022 to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Okay. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Aye. Mrs. Bustos, aye. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Mr. Case. Aye. Mr. Case, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Klein. No. Mr. Klein, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Christ. Can you hold for a second? I got a vote. One, one minute. Mr. Yes. Mr. Christ, aye. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Diaz-Balart. Mr. Diaz-Balart, no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat, aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Ms. Frankel. Aye. Ms. Frankel, aye. Mr. Garcia. No. Mr. Garcia, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Harder. Good job. Mr. Harder, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, no. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Ms. Kilmer, Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Can we have some order, please? I understand people are leaving, but we can't hear people's votes, so thank you. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Aye. Mrs. Lawrence, aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California, aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada, aye. Ms. McCollum. Yes. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Can Newhouse, we? no. Mr. Palazzo. Can we keep it down, please, so we can hear how people are voting? Thank you. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Okay. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers is a no. Did he vote? Did he vote? He is. He was right here. Oh. He voted and left. Mr. Ro Rogers, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yes. Mr. Ruppersberger, aye. Mr. Rutherford. No. Mr. Rutherford, no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Simpson. No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Wait a minute. Mr. Stewart? Mr. Stewart. Can we have, please, Mr. Stewart? Okay. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Trone. Aye. Mr. Trone, aye. 
Ms. Underwood. Aye. Ms. Underwood, aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Ms. Watson Coleman, aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Stewart. Stewart. Okay, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 33, the nays are 24, the motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill. The bill and report just approved, seeing no objection, so ordered. Three days. Three days. Okay, got it. Okay, so ordered. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, wait a minute, I have one official job to do here. One official job. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>